What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered. I am your host, Tyler Fowler. With me is my co two co-hosts, David Russell, Dale Glover, a good buddy of ours, Dane Von Ace, and our two guests, Dr. Bo Branson and Jay Dyer himself. Guys, how are you doing tonight? It's good to be with you all. David, what's up, brother? How you doing? Another week, brother, in the books. Doing all right, man. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. I'm tired, bro. Long week, you know, just garbage but i'm excited to have this conversation tonight so for uh, those that don't know the background to all of this right all of the orthodox shows we've been doing because we've been putting out a number of them we've had a couple debates with father jonathan ivanoff sam samuel frag and we've just been talking orthodoxy and so for those that don't know 
Uh, I'm really investigating orthodoxy, so much so that I've become a catechumen in the Orthodox Church. What's interesting is that both Dale and David are trying to keep me from going that way. Um, but I, like I said, I, I'm investigating. I want to know the truth, and I don't care what I label myself. Uh, I just want to follow Jesus the correct way, right? And so we've been uh, exploring orthodoxy. And so I have two very qualified individuals with us tonight to help me out with that. We're going to talk about Sola Scriptura, uh, J. Dyer, Bo, Bo Branson. And this, I, guys, I'm ready to I'm ready to kick this off. Dane, uh, before we do get started, Dane and Dale, how have you guys been? Dale, go ahead. Yeah, I've been good. Um, just did a show uh, earlier this morning on um, S.J. Thomason's channel that was on the Shroud of Turin. So we were looking at, at the medieval history of it and looking at the 1389 uh, Darcy Memorandum. So okay. yeah, this is my second show today. So you must be tired as well. Uh, I'm not as tired. No? I, I mean, I'm used to doing like four or five shows a week. So uh, I mean, like next week. This I'll is my second show today. I, I am tired officially. So uh, he, uh, he jerked some red cream soda, so he's ready to go. <laughs> There is some good energy in the Canadian red cream soda, yes. Uh, <laughs> right on, right on. Dane, how you doing, brother? Yo, I'm great. It's fun to be uh, back on Faith Unaltered. Always a pleasure. Um, I had a busy week. I've been in Memphis uh, for um, my church's like annual conference. It's more than I need to explain, but just a big church conference. And uh, got back home last night and went to the last night of vacation Bible school at our church. So uh that one night of vbs wore me out more than the whole conference uh from the past three days so um but i'm doing good i'm i'm in good spirits uh happy to be here to discuss uh solo scriptura with y'all it's going to be a fun show i believe so i do believe so all right so without further ado i will uh, let our guests introduce themselves take a couple minutes tell our audience about you guys uh we'll start with jay uh jay welcome and thank you for doing this i was excited to meet you a uh, couple, what, about a month ago now, you visited our parish, and that was a good conversation when we had a little bit of dialogue together. And so I was excited that you uh, you agreed to come on here and talk Solo Scriptura with us. So how are you doing, and how's 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 it been since we've uh, seen each other? Great. Yeah, it was really cool. I didn't realize, like I said, <clears throat> you guys are so close. I would have come to, to meet Dr. Branson much sooner if I'd known that he was that close. I, th yeah. I assumed, you know, when you hear other states, you think four, five, six hours away, but you guys are only two hours away. So, uh, yeah, we had a great weekend up there with you guys and, uh, got to meet everybody. And <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was cool to chat. And I, know, I remember you were asking about, you know, Sola Scriptura and mm -hmm. other issues like tradition and church fathers. And, um, so yeah, I'm happy to, to discuss that. I've had quite a few exchanges over the years with, uh, various Protestant pastors and apologists. And I myself, uh, did the Protestant Bible college for a while. So, so, yeah, I feel like I can, um, you know, hopefully have a good perspective on both sides of it to contribute to the conversation. And what I do is uh, do a lot of debates, do a lot of movie analysis, do a lot of geopolitics, uh, host the fourth hour of He Who Cannot Be Named every Friday. Um, what else do we do? We do live events now. So we do we do comedy and philosophy talks and all kinds of stuff. So you can find me uh, on YouTube or on Rockfin or uh, any of the other social media outlets. Right on. And I do have your channel uh, in the uh, description of this video. So if anybody wants that, they can just go down there and click it and it'll uh, lead you right to it. Uh, Dr. Bo Branson, how are you doing, my friend? Now, we met from uh, the Orthodox Church uh, that you attend and that I attend now. And so how are you doing, brother? And how's it been since the last time I seen you? I'm doing all right. Um, I don't have a whole, a whole ton of news like everybody else. I've just been writing this whole summer. So right on. Boring life. Do you want to plug your book that you're writing? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I'm in the middle of writing. A, it's going to be like a four views book about the Trinity. So it'll have um, it'll be me, William Lane Craig, Dale Tuggy and Bill Hasker. Um, so I'm, I'm in the middle of <clears throat> uh, finishing up my my criticisms of William Lane Craig as we speak. So <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, it should be interesting. I think it should be out sometime, maybe the end, end of the year or something like that. So, okay, keep us updated, and I'll uh, I'll keep yeah. people updated on my end for sure. So I'm excited to hear about that. But all right, guys, let's jump into it, shall we? I'm like I said, I'm I'm excited because here's the thing. So I don't 
what I don't want to accomplish in this discussion, I don't want to merely destroy Sola Scriptura or anything like that. If proven false, what I want to do is be able to present our listeners with a more robust, a stronger alternative to Sola Scriptura. And so to start out, I think, um, and you guys, uh, we'll, we'll start with Jay if you want. Uh, can you present us a positive case for the infallibility and authority for both scripture and the Orthodox tradition? Yeah, I can. Um, well, I mean, I can give you what I, how I would argue that. Um, yeah. But I did have one question before we started. Uh, not, yeah, I'm not ahead. trying to be rude or, or anything. I'm just curious. What, what type of Protestant tradition do you guys come from? Would you say classical Protestant, Reformed, or like evangelical lutheran what 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 protestant tradition are we talking about so i came from a protestant uh so southern baptist uh reformed uh so reformed southern baptist tradition and our other two protestant buddies here are they i'm similar? i'm evangelical I, I guess like you know will mccraig mike lacona those type okay yeah. i would say the same as dale okay yeah i'm just curious i'm a because... theological mutt as they say <laughs> yeah I, as I, josh I, says you know, because that just because that can kind of there can be a kind of a range of uh, levels to which, you know, people in the Protestant world may or may not give credence to tradition. So it just kind of depends on you know what how far back, I guess, in history we're talking about. But so the question is, what uh, relatively quick argument, I guess, would I give for the infallibility of scriptures and, and what the Orthodox Church being the also infallible church? Is that what the question was? Or just the just the authority of the Orthodox tradition versus like a Roman Catholic tradition or something like that. <laughs> okay, so I would say that that would be twofold. Uh, first argument I would make is that from scripture itself, uh, <clears throat> there's a continuity of revelation that comes from the Old Testament time when we didn't have what we could say is a fixed canon per se, even though in the Old Testament period we did have divine revelation that was conveyed through both an oral and a written uh, means, eventually as you know, Moses, Joshua, and the prophets write their text down. Prior to that, however, it's not written down, it's, it's oral. So I think one thing that we could derive from that that we would all, I think, agree on, if we, unless we're higher textual liberals or something, is that the the ability of to, to to transmit the information uh, orally is is something that God can providentially do, right? So there's nothing that prevents God's providence from uh, maintaining and preserving the the tradition that's passed on from Adam to to Abraham. <clears throat> that's that's uh, that's not written down, right? So He can still do that. Hmm. So when the text the revelation begins to be written down we might assume that therefore we would toss away the oral testimony um but one thing that's interesting in, in all the research that i've read and aside from maybe torah only jews that would argue or the Karaites or something most Judy, judaism historians and, and rabbi rabbinical uh history would agree that there was not a sola scriptura principle going on in the Old Testament period or the period of the, the Moses and the prophets. So, for example, we read in Isaiah speaks of the, the to the law and to the testimony, right? Mm -hmm. The law being, of course, the first five books, primarily testimony being the prophets and perhaps even the interpretive structure that the prophets themselves might give to the law of Moses and to sub, a prior revelation. So, uh, you know, when we have small texts like Zephaniah or something like this or uh, other uh, Old Testament minor prophets that are called uh, preachers, right? In other words, they were exited. They weren't just having one sentence of divine revelation or, or excuse me, one paragraph of a, a chapter of divine revelation. They may, but they might have also been preachers. And so this is a pre preaching is a prophetic office, and that doesn't always necessarily refer to predicting the future. And I know a lot of you guys probably already know that, but there's a reason I'm saying that, which is that they would be exegeting and expounding the law. And then as subsequent revelation came, it would be also exegeting and expounded. But again, at no point in any of that time frame in the Old Testament is that divine revelation restricted to only following the written text. And one way we know that is that when we get to the New Testament, when we have the fulfillment of a lot of the prophecies and a lot of what the Old Testament types were looking forward to, we have places in the Gospels where Jesus refers to traditions. 
Now, I understand that as a Protestant, you might say, well, but uh, Jesus is God, so he can refer to whatever traditions he wants to, and they therefore become infallible, you know, because he sort of references them or looks back to them. And But I would argue that we don't just see that ending with Christ. We see this as a continuing principle, even after the death of the last apostle. This is why, for example, we have the, you know, the phrase that uh, out, of, uh, behold, out of Egypt, uh, my son came out of Egypt, right? Which, right. Is, which is not a specific reference of anything in the Old Testament. It's interpreted to be either allegorical or, for some, or, or from uh, Hosea or one of the other passages, or it's interpreted to be uh, a reference to a, an extra canonical text. We have many references to extra canonical texts as well. Again, also from the Old Testament. So you have, for example, references to the books of the wars of the Lord. You have the references in the New Testament to the book of Enoch. And so for us, that suggests that divine revelation is not necessarily limited to only the written text, right? So you might say, well, but the it's still Sola Scriptura because really only that text that's referenced in the book of Jude from Enoch is the only infallible aspect. Everything else is is uh, doubtable or doubtful, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that if we restricted ourselves to a few examples, that might be the case. However, the, the best argumentation, I think, is when we get to the way that the prophets, or excuse me, the way the apostles preached, we find in Paul's epistles and in Peter's uh, epistles, the statement that they preach the word of God mm -hmm. and preaching the word of God during this apostolic period is not restricted to simply citing the text, right? It would be all of the, the oral teaching of the apostles. So for example, when Paul says that he commissioned Timothy, and I would argue that from the two letters to Timothy, he's, he's making Timothy the Bishop of Ephesus. He says, I laid hands on you, Timothy. Timothy, you then lay hands on men after you who are able to transmit this body of doctrine that's being handed to you. And he talks about all the things that you heard in the presence of many witnesses. If we go to the book of Acts, we know that Paul taught in Ephesus for three years, day and night. So Paul was, uh, you know, expositing and teaching far more orally than what he wrote, you see. And so that whole body of apostolic Pauline interpretation is what he's committed to Timothy to hand down. And you'll notice, by the way, that this is intimately tied to the succession of the bishopric. So the, the laying on of the hands and he even goes so far as to say that I appointed you, Timothy, in Ephesus. No one else is appointed in Ephesus, according to Paul's succession there. Mm -hmm. So that means that in the city of Ephesus, that at that apostolic time, there's literally only one correct believing church in Ephesus. That's the one that's quote orthodox, right? The correct believing one. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the apostles then went out and did the same thing. And we know, uh, I think because we have the presupposition of divine inspiration and, and divine providence, we know that they weren't teaching different things, right? So Paul wasn't teaching something different theologically, ultimately, than maybe what was being taught somewhere else. If there was a disagreement, we know that Acts 15, we have the Jerusalem Council, and the decision of, uh, you know, coming together and deciding, okay, let's not require of the Gentiles more than was expected of them in the Noahic covenant, right, for mm -hmm. admission into the church. If, God, if Noah can be righteous before God prior to Abraham and the giving of circumcision, then circumcision can't be absolutely necessary for righteousness before God. Therefore, they come to this decision on the basis of, again, not just citing the text of Scripture. They do cite the text of Scripture, but... There's references, is what I'm saying, even in the book of Acts, to non-canonical things, to extra-biblical things, principal traditions. For example, it's more blessed to give than to receive, Acts says Jesus taught. Of course, we don't have any written record of Jesus teaching that. A couple more examples. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 23 that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. That's the cathedra in the Greek. And that's the idea of a cathedral, the bishop sitting in the seat of of the cathedral, right? Mm -hmm. So Moses, so when Ezra set up what we know of as the rabbinical system or the synagogue system, this was so that Israel could have teachers that weren't just located in uh, Jerusalem, right? So you could have a, a teaching of the law throughout the land of Israel. This is where we get Allah Ezra, the synagogue system. So Jesus is essentially saying that it is the tradition in the church, or excuse me, in, in, in the first century uh, worship at temple synagogue, 
worship service, the presupposition is the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, do as they say, but not do as they do. Hmm. There's no text anywhere in the Old Testament that explains this authoritative succession of a seat of Moses. Therefore, it is a tradition that Jesus is recognizing and accepting. And we can think of many, many other examples. And I'm going to try to finish this up soon. I know it's, it's you're good. A little, well, I mean, no. you ask a tough question. It's like, can you prove your whole system in like one? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, you know, we have, we have uh, other textual uh, references. One I wanted to mention too, that just came to mind uh, <clears throat> in the book of uh, Chronicles, we have the reference that uh, Hezekiah organized the worship. I think this is where I'm going from memory. Hezekiah organized the liturgical worship as laid down by his father, David. And it talks about not just the liturgical worship in the sense of having an altar and having, you know, the Levitical ceremonies. It's the actual service, the liturgical worship service, and it's ordering with the music and the symbols and all this kind of stuff. So this is based on tradition. Now we know that God's very concerned with how we worship him because in the story, uh, what is it? Leviticus 10 or 11, Nate Evan Abai who offers strange fire uh, and God doesn't accept that. So, you know, many Protestants, if you're a classical reform Protestant, you'll talk about the regulative principle of worship that we can't worship God in any way or in any pattern other than what he's given us. And believe it or not, as Orthodox, I think we would argue, yeah, you're correct. However, when we come to the new Testament, we don't actually have, the specific pattern of how the service is supposed to be conducted. Mm -hmm. I understand that, yes, Paul in Corinthians limits us about certain abuses, and he says don't uh, celebrate the cup, uh, getting drunk and fornicating, and don't do this. But there's not actually an explicit order of the service, just like there was no explicit written pattern of how the worship service was to be conducted. And yet we're told in Chronicles that Hezekiah ordered the service according to the pattern of his father David. I think David was two, 250, 100 years, you know, before Hezekiah. So there was this tradition as to how the liturgical worship of Israel was to be done. Now, coming to my final uh, points here, I would argue that in terms of Sola Scriptura, when we get into the post-apostolic period, we find the church fathers, especially in the first three centuries, many of them absolutely citing texts, many of them citing many texts. And because of that textual witness, we can reconstruct fairly accurate fairly consistent gospel um there's an attestation is what i'm trying to say uh from these first three century church fathers for example in irenaeus's against heresies from about 180 there's a, a ton of texts that are cited right so you could you could compile kind of what irenaeus knew of as the bible pretty well but what we don't we still don't get uh for these three centuries uh is any clear pattern or idea of what the absolute canon of scripture is now we get marcion who's one of the first to set up his own canon so actually the first idea of a specific canon comes from a heretic and it still ironically doesn't prompt the church at this point to actually lay out a definitive canon of scripture and for the orthodox we have obviously a little bit of disagreement with the roman catholics because they typically cite certain uh councils under pope damasus and during the time of augustine for their canon of scripture uh, we, because we don't defer to just papal fiat and authority, we're not immediately going to accept that. However, it is an attestation to the fact that in the West, it, in the days of Augustine, it was pretty clearly understood that the deuterocanonical canonical texts were absolutely part of the canon of Scripture. Mm -hmm. In the East, there are varying canons, and I'll, we can go to some of the uh, academic literature that I have from uh, evangelical scholars. I usually try to restrict my citation and sourcing when this debate comes up to, to Protestant evangelical scholars. One of the great books on this is by Lee McDonald, Formation of the Christian Biblical Canon. And at the back yeah. of the text, he gives an appendix that's very helpful for showing um, between Old Testament and New Testament the differing canons that were pretty popular in different church fathers and in different centuries. So for example, and I, again, I'm going to wrap up with this point here to try to make it very quick. And then I'll tie in how this relates to the infallibility of the church. But sure. for example, uh, when we look at some of the earliest lists of the canon of scripture, for example, the old Testament we have in the fourth and fifth century, we have the predominant canons of Melito, Sardis, Origen, Athanasius, and Cyril of Jerusalem, as well as Epiphanius uh, and Gregory Nazianzus. Okay. So there's, there's, 
commonalities amongst these lists and the differing sort of competing canons that were being used. However, there's also quite a bit of, of difference here. For example, Melito's canon does not include the deuterocanonical text. However, uh, Athanasius's canon does include certain deuterocanonical texts. For example, the letter of Barak. It includes the Epistle of Jeremiah. It includes uh, First and Second Ezra. Uh, whereas Cyril Jerusalem's canon includes Barak, Epistle of Jeremiah, uh, but not the. Let's see. There's one difference that they have that he has with Athanasius on uh, Esther. So Cyril Jerusalem includes Esther. Athanasius does not include Esther, as far as I can tell, at least from Lee McDonald's list here of the canon. Um, Epiphanius has basically the same list, it looks like, as Cyril of Jerusalem, but that's just the Old Testament text. And Gregor of Nazianzus, interestingly, includes, uh, actually leaves out quite a few Old Testament texts that even Protestants would accept. So the point is that we're getting a lot of varying canons, and there's there's a few more here. There is um, Council of Laodicea, which includes the Epistle of Jeremiah mm -hmm. uh, and Barak, and then there is the New Testament. We'll move on to the New Testament canon here. Um, Hillary lists. No, I'm sorry. This is the uh, that was the East. This is the Latin Church's West Old Testament. The the, the Western Church's Old Testament canon. Now, uh, Hillary has a, a list that includes Tobit. Uh, Jerome, of course, has what Protestants accept as the Old Testament canon. And Jerome's argument, of course, was that, well, that's what Jews are accepting, so we'll go with that, which I don't think is that good of an argument. By the way, Jerome, of course, taught most of the other things that Protestants don't teach, so I don't I don't think Jerome's going to be too great of a source. Rufinus has a, a, a selection of Old Testament books, which is fairly consistent with the Protestant canon. Of course, Augustine, the Council of Rome, Council of Hippo, Codex Vaticanus, none of those will work for the Protestant uh, canon at all. They typically include the deuterocanonical text, but they also have differences amongst themselves, by the way. Hmm. So Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, also having mostly deuterocanonical text, but also variations amongst them. Then moving into uh, other church fathers, Eusebius um, disputes uh, the Catholic epistles, interestingly. Clement um, includes texts that we wouldn't include. Uh, we wouldn't include the Shepherd of Hermas, the Acts of Paul, or the Revelation of Peter. Cyril of Jerusalem uh, in his New Testament canon has what we would typically would include, but he also does not believe that the book of Revelation was canonical. And this is going to be important because one of the interest, one of the crucial points that we want to stress for Orthodox when it comes to canonicity was that a lot of the church did not accept the book of Revelation is can canonical. And it was actually Athanasius. If you read F.F. F. Bruce's book, Canon of Scripture, who's one of the most famous Protestant evangelical scholars, he's got some great chapters on uh, Athanasius convincing Rome that, no, actually, we should include uh, the Catholic epistles and the book of Revelation. So to me, that suggests that, no, we can't really divorce. I mean, it's easy for us nowadays to look back and say, well, we have this, you know, this basic 66 books of the King James Bible, the Protestant canon. Why can't we just go with that? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Again, put your mind in the, in the attitude of a person in the fourth, fifth, sixth century, when you go to your local church mm -hmm. and there's not a specific necessarily Bible there, right? There's not a 66 books of the Bible. Here's the key point. What is there there? You're going to have lectionaries, daily readings that are being done in the churches. And when I got into a lot of these Protestant scholars talking about how the, the canon came to be, I didn't even realize as a Protestant guy, reform guy, that liturgy was a huge piece of the puzzle for how the canon came to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it was the only puzzle piece, but it's a big piece because when canonicity is being discussed and, and for us as Orthodox, it eventually comes about by the time of Trollo and the sixth council. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we would find attestation to the earlier uh, Pope Damasus and, and uh, Augustine canon, but it doesn't necessarily for us equate to uh, ecumenical status until it's really covered by the ecumenical council. And then it's received by the rest of the church. So the irony here is that for the Orthodox, the canon is really late. And even then, it's still kind of flexible because uh, John Damascus, when he lists his canon, 
it's the same as the Orthodox canon, but he also lists an extra. I think he's, I think he says Clement. He thinks Clement is canonical as well, which is interesting because I, I'm not sure why he thought that. There's probably scholars that could tell you why he thought that. I think but he has sure. the apostolic canons or something. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, he does. You're right. He has the canons, and I, I think he has Clement in there too. But um, that might be because he's going from an earlier, you know, ruling from you know a, a synod, or he might have just been pulling from. Was it Cyril Jerusalem? Anyway, point being is that uh, for us, it's pretty late. And, you know, liturgy played a key role in that. So when the church fathers said, okay, what books are canonical? Well, let's look at what books were used and read in certain important ancient apostolic sees. Let's look to the ancient liturgies, the liturgy of St. Mark, uh, liturgy of St. Basil. Uh, let's look to the daily readings and the lectionaries that are read in the churches. Let's look to the tradition of the church and the various seas in terms of what their their tradition was about apostolicity. Mm -hmm. uh, because, for example, Matthew doesn't list who the author is. So the, the only way that we would know that Matthew was written by the Apostle Matthew is that the church's tradition says this is Matthew the Apostle's gospel, right? right. And so ferreting that out from um, pseudepigrapha, which are not necessarily heterodox. I mean, there's pseudepigrapha that might contain true tradition. I think uh, our liturgy, you know, references things that are in some of the pseudo pseudepigraphical texts. Mm -hmm. The point being that if canonicity is strictly requiring apostolic authorship, which sometimes Protestants argue, there's a lot of problems there because we're immediately going to have to rely on the testimony of the church. Again, to exa for example, to know that Matthew wrote Matthew's gospel and that we shouldn't accept other pseudepigraphical texts that have, you know, apostles' names attached to them. Right. So it's a, a confluence of things, is what I'm trying to say, that go into how and why the church chose what books they did. And you cannot divorce it from this historical process. Uh, therefore, if I do believe the text and I do believe the guidance of the church within history, just like I believe God's providence can guide abraham to faithfully know the, tr the the tradition passed down from adam mm -hmm. i can believe that god's providence can continue to preserve in the church which is something more than what was existing in the old testament which is the body right the, so jesus says in the gospels as you know that he will send the holy spirit in the gospel of john and that the spirit will guide you and lead you into all truth and mm -hmm. for us he's speaking to the collective body of the church there right and that promise didn't leave when the last apostle died. It's not like when John died, okay, well, the Holy Spirit's gone, so good luck. You know, hopefully you can figure it out. Uh, here's a roadmap of DIY, and <laughs> hopefully you don't come up with a liturgy or, or church worship service that God hates. No, there's a pattern of worship that Moses, that, that, excuse me, the Adam path, that, that, that not Adam, I'm getting, uh, I had too much coffee today because I was having to do this <laughs> podcast, but <laughs> there's a pattern of worship the apostles laid down in the seas that they went and, and evangelized and set up. And immediately after the apostles, that's precisely what we see when we read Ignatius, when we read Clement, when we read Ambrose, when we read Cyprian, when we read Irenaeus, they, Justin Martyr, they have this liturgical pattern of worship. Yeah. And even in Justin Martyr or in Irenaeus, we have them discussing the liturgy and its, its celebration but we still don't even have like a full on worship service, but we can go to ancient texts like the liturgy of St. Mark at Alexandria. And I think it dates from, I don't know, 200 or something like that. We can see um, other uh, liturgical celebrations from around that same time. For example, the Easter controversy. So we know the church was celebrating Pascha and Easter early on because they were having these big debates with Pope, uh, Pope Victor over it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the quarto deseminarian controversy. So we mm -hmm. know that liturgical worship is the norm. Absolutely. During these time periods, even if we don't have Aaron, Ace, Justin, Mark giving us a full service, we do have those services is my point. And those services play a key role centuries later in the determination of the canon. Therefore we must have some historical body that is the preserver and the expositor the guardian of this tradition. And I would argue that the first thousand years of Christianity, when we go to those councils, when we go to those synods, that synodal structure that we have in, in Acts 15, the mm -hmm. church operates precisely in that way, both in local synods, even though we see those, you know, council of Gangra, Elvira, we, we have ecumenical synods, which we see with, you know, Nicaea and the subsequent ecumenical councils. Mm -hmm. 
and the canons of those councils, I would say, are one of the strongest arguments against the the papal perspective. So the so you asked me specifically too about Roman Catholicism and why Orthodox and not Roman Catholic. Well, I would say that the easiest way to demonstrate that without going into papal documents and and papal dogma and Roman Catholic dogma would be to say, well, we know kind of the claims of Rome about what it sees itself as, as the true church. Mm -hmm. But is that the way the church operated in the first millennium? And if the church of the first millennium operated in an orthodox synodal way, and I think that it's demonstrable that they did. And if there are canons in every one of the ecumenical councils, the first seven at least, mm -hmm. that actually directly contradict and conflict with the Vatican I claim and interpretation, to me, that's the strongest proof possible that the church of the first millennium was not the papal monarchical system, but rather a synodal system of first amongst equals. And by the way, the Alexandria document that just came out that we just did a live stream on uh, pretty much, it basically concedes about 90 to 95% of the Orthodox points, I should add, which is a wow. Roman Catholic, uh, a, a, a Francis approved uh, commission. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say those things are the reasons why uh, I think that the soul scripture is not true. And the formation of the canon basically requires some notion of the infallibility of the church within history. Right on, right on. Well, y'all, we can just pack up and go home. Jay just killed it. And so we're done here. I mean, there's yeah. nothing else left to say. No, it's fine. Uh, but no, I, there, Jay, there's so many things that you said there I want to hit on. First and foremost, thank you, uh, because I actually got uh, Lee, Mc, uh, Lee Martin McDonald's book because you recommended it. I also got FF Bruce. Uh, so if those who are interested, if you don't have any money, uh, that's actually fine because if you sign up for a free trial on Scribe, they've got the audio book of FF, of FF Bruce, uh, the canon of scripture on there for free. And you just cancel the uh, free trial whenever you're done with it. Uh, but but great books and things that, you know, things were mentioned in those books that really led me deeper. So I ended up getting this book, the Biblical Canon, um, from uh, Lee Martin McDonald. And I also got his a uh, newer version out the formation of the old and new testament canon on logos and so i'm diving into those now uh big thick books haven't finished them yet uh but i'm really interested in seeing which way uh lee mcdonald is going to go there but let me let me just ask my host real quick guys is there anything in what jay said uh that you want to touch on maybe some key points or highlights that stood out to you guys dale or david um and then we'll go to dane as well uh, yeah, I have a couple couple questions. I was trying to write down a, a okay. bunch of ones. One of the first things you said there, Jay, is about, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible in God's providence that he could preserve the oral tradition um, through the succession and that sort of thing. So I just kind of wanted to ask your take from an Orthodox perspective, because obviously when it comes to the down to the preservation of the written scripture, um, even the most conservative evangelical scholars and Bible scholars do admit it's not 100%. It's probably about 95% been preserved. Um, so how do you, like, if, if that's not 100% infallible in terms of the written scriptures, why does it need to be 100% infallible in terms of the preservation of the oral tradition? Or, or is it? Do, do you guys think there could be some minor errors there? Or? I would say that the... What we talk about when we talk about passing on the uh, faith once for all delivered to the saints, that would be re that would be referring to the totality of the divine revelation committed to the apostles and to their successors. So that's a body of doctrines ultimately that includes things like you know previous scripture and uh, apostolic exegesis and things like the the liturgy. So in, in other words, we believe that Paul, you know, really did set up a liturgical worship service. Right. And <clears throat> for us, this is an important point about Scripture. Scripture is more of a liturgical document than it is like a private devotional document. There's nothing wrong with you reading it as a private devotion, but it's not primarily for that. It's primarily for an ordered worship service. And that's why the Jews actually operated the same way. Right. They had a structure of how you would read certain certain texts and certain books in certain orders. And then it kind of concludes with um, nowadays, at least the synagogue system, which does have a, a basis in a lot of the older temple and synagogue services from the patristic and, and uh, time of Christ era, like there's a structure to that. And so for us, we simply adopted that same structure and pattern because we would say that Paul set up this kind of worship out of the existing temple and synagogue systems. That's why there's a great book on this that, uh, my buddy Lewis, he did a whole documentary that you could look up on Orthodox Shahada, 
Mm-hmm. And the book is Orthodox Worship, Living Continuity with the Synagogue, the Temple, and the Early Church. And it kind of makes this point. So the way it relates to what you were asking about the inerrancy of certain texts. So the question of inerrancy, I think, is a different question from whether or not there was a historical place for the church to determine the canon. Um, I don't know of anybody that, except for maybe like a King James onlyist that thinks that literally every, like, you know, uh, jot and tittle is necessarily, quote, infallible or inerrant in that sense, because we have to go from uh, copious manuscripts, which do have like, you know, minor discrepancies amongst them. So, but, but copyist errors is different from whether the body of doctrines handed down has been faithfully preserved and, and, and whether or not the texts themselves for the most part exhibit continuity and inspiration, which I would say they do. I think they're God breathed. Right. Uh, but that is it, but we don't have autographa. So we don't have the actual text that Paul wrote or Matthew wrote. This is again, another thing that points to the uh, necessity of the church in this. If I, if I can't go in a time machine and see what Matthew was writing, and I don't even have copies of Matthew. I think like, you know, there's like a fragment of John from the year 90 or 100, right? Most of the other uh, fragments and gospel collections are second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries. So again, I'm having the point you're making, I would concede it. And I would say all the more reason why we have to kind of distrust the testimony of the church and God's providence to preserve the text, because we don't have the autographa, meaning the ones written by Paul or Matthew. Gotcha. All right, cool. And just one last question before I turn it to David to, to save time. But um, one thing, so I, I was interested, you mentioned some uh, models in the New Testament times that you think kind of support uh, sort of um, what one biblical scholar calls a formal controlled process type thing, right? Um, but there, there are, I think there's other models too, whereby an informal controlled uh, transmission of oral tradition could also work, right? So we have the Bereans, for example, they, they don't just defer to what Paul says, they check for themselves in the scriptures to see, to test the teachers and the leaders and stuff to see, are they telling the truth or not? So do you think- Well, but yeah, and I, I think that's a good question. But if you know, if you notice Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 already laid down the principle that any coming prophet has to be consistent with prior revelation. So anybody in the days of Isaiah, if they were lettered, they might conceivably do the same thing. Oh, here's a guy, Isaiah, over here claiming to be a prophet. I can check and see if I'm lettered. You know, is, is what he's saying consistent with prior, prior previous divine revelation? Yes, it is. So therefore, uh, maybe I should listen to him, right? So if we're in a period when there is ongoing divine revelation, it's definitely necessary that we would cross-reference and check what's being said with prior revelation. But... And I would, I'm assuming if you're Protestant, you believe that there's some kind of cessation at some point with the death of the apostles uh, for public divine revelation, unless you're, you're charismatic. I don't know. But um, no. I, 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 what, what I'm saying is that cross-referencing and checking revela- divine revelation that's new doesn't really in any way affect whether such soul scriptura is true or whether there's oral tradition or not. Okay. Uh, just one <laughs> quick follow-up, if, if you don't mind. I know I said that was my last yeah, question. Okay. Just, just to follow up quickly on that. So. Are, are you saying for the, from my understanding, I thought the Orthodox divine revelation uh, in terms of the oral tradition is still open, right? Like you guys, I know you no. guys ended the seven ecumenical councils, but couldn't there be a future council or is it only? No. Ecumenical councils are not new divine revelations. So divine revelation is a body of teaching of the full apostolic deposit, we could say. Okay. So for example, Jude says, Jude speaks of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So when John died, I would I would argue there's not any new public divine revelation. Ecumenical councils expositing uh, the, the apostolic deposit is not new divine revelation. So those are different things. We would say that the councils explicate and they make precise what is already there in the, the data of divine revelation. So there's nothing that there's not a new divine revelation. Gotcha. So it's kind of they're infallible or inspired in adjudicating on the previous revelation type. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, over to you, David. I don't have nothing as of yet. I'm still thinking and writing out questions that we'll probably I'll try to get back to later. That was a lot to take in. <laughs> I mean, uh, can't, can't hit on uh, one point. That was a very broad question for you, and I'm glad that you had the gumption and, and drive to answer it <laughs> the way you did. So thank you for that. 
All right, right on. Let me, so let's go to Dane. Dane, if you've got any questions or, or if you want to add anything, and then we'll go to Bo uh, to see if uh, Bo wants to add anything as well. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that was an awesome uh, answer yeah. to a big question, uh, Jay. So thank you for that. And I did want to ask one follow up around um, the synodal structure of the Orthodox Church and, and the councils. And just sort of ask a question that I've heard um, some Protestant apologists uh, bring up when when talking to some Orthodox uh, folks. And it's the question of like, how how do we know the Orthodox Church is on the correct side of every synod when there are dissenters who would say that they're apostolic? So an example being um, the Coptic Church and the Mon Monophysites, um, you know, not not ad adhering to Chalcedon. And so what's the way to discern the Orthodox Church, the Chalcedonian Creed? It's it's solid, it's sound, it's apostolic when we have this group of the Monophysites claiming that they're actually um, correct in rejecting that synod. So if you could parse that out, I'd, I'd love to hear your answer. Dr. Branson or me? Who are you asking to? Either one. If uh, I mean... Whoever wants to be excited. I'll let Dr. Brant say, I've, I've been rambling for a whole time. So no, you probably know more about that than I than I do. I'll have some stuff to say to follow up on. Um, well, I would say that a lot of times, the question you've asked, a lot of times uh, people are confusing two different categories. I'm not saying you're necessarily doing that, but in this debate discussion, which I've been you know hearing and having for probably 20 years on this question of authority and how do we know which one is right and, and who who's got the legitimate claims, I would say between a Protestant, a Roman Catholic and an Orthodox, we all kind of are in the same boat. All of those systems will ult in the final analysis admit that the only ultimate assurance that the individual has is the work of the Holy Spirit. They all at least give verbal credence to that at some point. For the Roman Catholic, the assurance is supposed to come through the Holy Spirit leading the individual through ultimately the papal documents, right? I mean, the, the magisterium, which is ultimately the, the papal pr approval and statements uh, are the final arbiter, right? The final word on the issues. And so the assumption being that the individual Roman Catholic then is supposed to be in a privileged position epistemically to be able to parcel out all of the, the papal teachings into their correct bins and categories of authority, right? So that's how the papal system works. The Protestant system is similar, except that it's, the Holy Spirit leading the individual to accurately understand and interpret the text of scripture ultimately. Right. So for the Orthodox person, um, we agree that ultimately the final arbiter of assurance for an individual has to be the Holy Spirit working on the heart of the individual. But where we would disagree with those other two systems is the means that he uses. So whereas we're not primarily saying that the means of certainty and assurance, I'm not saying that Roman Catholicism is reduced to papal documents, but in terms of knowing the dogmas and having assurance in their system, it is. That is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, leading you to the papal documents, right? And by the way, if you got, if you're a Protestant, it's I would argue it's easier uh, because you've got this one. If you're Roman Catholic, I've got like a giant stack of papal documents, so it's, you got a lot more work to do, right? You got a lot, <laughs> a lot more to weed through. So hopefully, you can put them in the right bins. But um, <clears throat> So where we disagree with the Protestant, as I said, is that the, the Bible has its place and it's definitely, I would argue, inspired and it, it's inerrant, uh, again, in terms of the body of doctrines passed down to the church. I don't mean that. I don't think that means that every copyist manuscript is inerrant. I think there are a few copyist errors, but even still, it has a great, I mean, it's amongst all the ancient texts, as far as I'm aware, it's the most unanimity and, and historical attestation above any other texts that are out there. Like Plato has only oldest text of Plato from like the middle ages or whatever. So, um, so it has its place and all that, but it's it, none of that equates to being the ultimate authority or the sole authority or the final arbiter, because it's kind of like, if you think about the constitution, right? The, the, the constitution is the nation's uh, ultimate authoritative document. However, we need some kind of role of existing people to exposit that and give the final word on the law. And that's, of course, what the Supreme Court is. The Supreme Court ex exposits and kind of gives the final interpretation of the document. And we're just simply arguing that in not just because we want it to be the case, but that Jesus actually did establish uh, a body of teachers who have authority. And then we see that in Acts 15 and we see the church continuing that synodal 
system all the way up until till today. And by the way, the normative governing governing system is local synods, right? It's not actually ecumenical. So you got 300 years with no ecumenical synod, mm -hmm. yet the church is continuing to exist. So, so assurance comes on in the one sense for the individual by the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, I think Saint Simeon the New Theologian has a whole great chapter on that uh, in his uh, mystical discourses. But for <clears throat> public profession, the Orthodox just simply disagrees with the model that the Roman Catholic Church has and the model that the Protestant has. And, and we would argue that the first thousand years of the Church, which are so crucial, especially for the Roman Catholic apologetic, that they demonstrate this synodal public confession. So. How am I going to know whether the Chalcedonians are right or whether um, the uh, you know anti-Chalcedonians are right? Well, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to turn off our brains, right? We're not going to be able to just pick a an authority figure, right? I mean, that's the the Romans says, "Oh, I'll just pick that." Well, and then and the process is, "Oh, I'll just, I'll just pick the Bible." None of the neither of those really answers or solves the individual knowing for sure which one's right because you still have to go into interpreting and, and knowing the information. So, but beyond that, there are other things in the councils, for example. Uh, and so Chalcedon, for example, the question would be, is Chalcedon consistent with Ephesus? And so every one of the ecumenical councils begins with, after Nicaea, obviously begins with the notion that we are continuing the tradition of what we said before. And this kind of builds all the way up, you know, through the seven slash eight councils up until the Palamites and us for the Orthodox, that we're being consistent with the canons and the revelation that came before. So it's true that there are false foul, councils, Robertson out of Ephesus and all that for us, but there's really no way to adjudicate this problem without going into the actual specifics of the argumentation. There's no a priori way to know, oh, uh, I, 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 this is the right council because the, of the Pope, right? Because the, the Roman Catholic system itself actually doesn't give you a consistent, coherent list of the councils. For example, Lateran mm -hmm. 649 should be a Roman Catholic ecumenical council based on their system, but it's not. It never has been. Uh, and the reason it wasn't at that time, if I recall, is because the emperor didn't sign on to it. Well, if it was the papal system at that time, who cares whether the emperor signed? Doesn't, it shouldn't matter. But uh, anyway, long, long story short is that, yeah, the, 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 there's certain structures and things within the councils themselves about universal acceptance and this kind of stuff and has to eventually be received by the whole church and so it's not just this total top-down model um, but it's also not a total bottom-up model where it's like well it's all the word of the people or you know that that would be more of a protestant model right because of the protestant doctrines of uh freedom of conscience and that you can't bind me to your interpretation these kinds of things right so it's it's i would just argue that history demonstrates that it's neither protestant nor the the roman catholic model and the specifics of the oriental question are a little more hairy, but if you go into the actual theological issues, I think we can show who's right and who's wrong. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, man. Right on, right on. All right. Uh, Dr. Branson, is there anything that you would like to add uh, to either the question that Dane asked or to uh, the arguments and the positive case that Jay yeah. brought up a little bit ago? Yeah. Um, I could just give some, some thoughts that I had um, that, obviously kind of support Jay's position because it's my position, but yeah. um, I, the, the way I kind of, I mean, part of what got me um, interested in orthodoxy was I was very interested in Judaism uh, first and in, in Judaism, there's this idea, I mean, in, in the Bible, right? God gives the Torah to Moses, the written Torah, but then it's, it's just taken for granted that, people will have disputes about the law, right? It's not taken for granted that like, it's so clear that there'll never be any, you know, any reason to worry about it. So God just takes it for granted. Of course, people are going to be arguing about how to interpret this and how it applies and whatever. And so Moses will be the judge, right? Mm. So God specifically gives that authority of interpreting the Torah to Moses. And then an interesting thing that happens is uh, God never tells Moses to delegate that authority, but his, his father-in-law does. And so Moses just says, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm here from, you know, morning till evening. So, so he sets up this whole hierarchical system where, you know, over, I think it was groups of 50 or a hundred or whatever, there's judges. And then there's a whole kind of system to appeal it all the way up to Moses. Right. 
Uh, and it, the interesting thing, I mean, one interesting thing about that is is just the concept of sort of delegating authority. It just seems to be taken for granted in Scripture that if God has given Moses this authority, then Moses has the authority to delegate it to people below him if he wants to, right? Because that's never something he asks God about. God doesn't give him a commandment about it. It's his father-in-law, and he just does that, right? And the the Jewish tradition is that, of course, uh, Moses then passed that authority down to Joshua and the 70 elders. And it describes part of that in the Bible, right, where he lays his hands on uh, on Joshua. And it says that, you know, God's going to take from the spirit that's on Moses and put it on Joshua. So you get this idea of the laying on of hands, um, which is a big deal in, in the Jewish idea of ordination. And then... Uh, uh, Jay mentioned Ezra too, who, you know, when you, when you have people coming back from uh, the Babylonian captivity and all this, like you've, you've got a situation where people don't really speak Hebrew. So the text is in Hebrew, but people really, you know, are speaking in Aramaic. And that's actually kind of the origin of where we had, why we have a sermon today. It goes back to, you know, what would have just been this liturgical reading of a section of the Torah but because people couldn't really understand that, they would read it in Hebrew and then they would read it in Aramaic or they would interpret it to the people in Aramaic. And that's where we get the idea of a, of a homily. And that's also where like you get the Targums and this sort of thing. And, and also um, in the, at the same time, I think it's in Ezra or Nehemiah that, that God talks about like, you know, you'll, they'll, they'll have to be people set up who can interpret the, the law for the people, right? So again, he just kind of takes for granted that there needs to be a class of people who are experts who just devote themselves to to learning the Torah and being able to to interpret it and apply it. Uh, and the Jewish tradition is in that gets passed down again from so it's from Moses to the the seventy elders to the judges. I forgot to mention the judges, and then Ezra, and then down to the rabbis and the, the men of the great assembly and the Sanhedrin. Mm-hmm. Um, and an interesting thing uh, is uh, people people overlook this because the way it's translated in the Gospel of John. But in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus celebrates Hanukkah, and it's it's translated in English. In your Bible, it'll say something like the Feast of Dedication, uh, and people don't necessarily realize that that's the official name for Hanukkah. Um, so when in the Book of the Maccabees. Uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, you know, desecrates the temple and sacrifices, you know, it was like pork or whatever, you know, to Zeus or something. And so then it had to be rededicated. So the Feast of Dedication celebrates the rededication of the temple. That's nowhere in the Protestant Bible, right? So so it's it's not in Protestant scripture. It's not, and the, the feast isn't even really mentioned in the book of the Maccabees. The Maccabees talks about the events but it's just something that the rabbis created, uh, the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, and Jesus is there celebrating it, right? And so he and and he tells the disciples at one point, you know, whatever the Pharisees say, you should do what they say because they sit in the seat of Moses. Mm-hmm. But he says, don't do as they do because he thought they were hypocrites, right? But it, but it's interesting because he doesn't say like, oh, forget about them, they're hypocrites, so they don't count. He says. You have to do what they say because they sit in the seat of Moses. So he mm. he seems to say that they do have the authority to create new festivals that are not mentioned in the Torah. Um, he seems to think they have authority that the, that the disciples have to follow it and, and so forth. Uh, and then there's a the passage about binding and loosing that I always um, uh, get amused when I hear certain interpretations of it. Um, when people talk about like binding and loosing demons, like as though you would want to loose demons. Um, <laughs> so, Fair but, enough. <laughs> but uh, but if you, um, uh, I got interested in that because of the it, it's mentioned by David Stern in the the Messianic Jewish Manifesto and in his uh, Jewish New Testament commentary. But if you just look up binding and loosing on the Jewish Encyclopedia. Um, those are technical terms uh, in rabbinic Judaism that you see all over the Talmud, right? Uh, and it's it's essentially, um, so the term for an interpretation, the, the Jewish sort of technical term about an interpretation of the Torah is halacha, right? So from the word halach, meaning to, to walk. So it's mm-hmm. the way in which you should go. So it says, you know, Moses will tell you 
the way in which you should go. In other words, if you, you know, or have a dispute about how to interpret the Torah. Hmm. So halakha is, uh, is sort of like, it's kind of like the equivalent of like, like common law, like judge made law, right? So you have the, like the constitution is written, but you know, a judge will interpret it. And then once they've made that interpretation then that sets the precedent and future, uh, you know, future legal cases have to follow the same precedent. And in Judaism, that's the idea is that, you know, the rabbis or whoever is around at the time, they'll they'll issue halacha. Uh, and then, you know, you have to kind of follow the, the precedent. And um, and the term for that, the, the term for uh, for forbidding something is binding. And the, the term for permitting something is loosing. So you'll mm-hmm. see like, you know, the house of Hillel uh, binds divorce, uh, and the house of Shammai looses divorce or whatever. Uh, and, and the, the way, so in, in Judaism, what you would do, right. If you, of course, I mean, if you have a, you know, little minor sort of questions or disputes or whatever, you would just go to your local rabbi. If it's a, if it's a bigger issue, there's what they call a bet din, a house of judgment, which has to be a, it's basically a council of at least three or more rabbis. Right. Mm. Um, and uh, and there so they can have a bet. Then they and they issue halakha, they bind or loose, whatever. Right. Um, and there's kind of there's stuff in the Talmud about this that like, you know, when they when a, a bet din binds or looses, whatever, you know, God in heaven will confirm that, you know, that decision. And so if you look at the language that Jesus uses, it's very clear. And like I said, you can just look up binding and loosing in the Jewish encyclopedia. And they say this, they're like, yeah, that's what Jesus is clearly talking about here. Cause it's exactly the same sort of structure. He says, wherever two or three, and by the way, he's not in that passage. He's not addressing a big multitude of people. He's specific. The only the 12 disciples are there. Right. In that scene. So he's not addressing like all Christians everywhere. He's mm-hmm. addressing the 12 disciples and he says, whatever, wherever two or three of you, the disciples are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of you. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what it seems like he's saying is that he's he's giving them the authority to make halakha right, from the Messiah, not from Moses, right? And since he's greater than Moses, they have an even greater authority now, right? And if you if you assume, I mean, it, and that's even Protestant scholars will will acknowledge this if they if they've, you know, um, uh, you can you can find some Protestant commentaries on those verses and so forth. Um, the thing that they'll they'll usually uh, try to argue is um, you know, whether that can be passed down uh, or if it was going to just, you know, for the 12 disciples. But my what I would say is, you know, it, it's clearly mirroring. Um, I mean, there's there's nothing in the actual Old Testament about binding and loosing and all of that. That's all Jewish oral tradition and or the oral Torah. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and so uh, in, in any way in the Jewish system, I mean, it, it is passed down. And the way that it's passed down is through the laying on of hands. Um, and so you you see this in the in the book of Acts too, right, where the the apostles will lay hands for various things. One is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but also when they're ordaining um, uh, deacons and presbyters and and so forth. Um, and so also I would point out that in in the book of Acts, so just like with Moses, <clears throat> um, he doesn't wait for God to sort of tell him that he can delegate this power. It's just sort of taken for granted that he can delegate it and he can pass it down if he wants to. And in the book of Acts, what you find is the apostles, once the community gets too big and there's these kind of disputes between the Hellenizers or the Greeks and the the Hebrews, um, they appoint the seven deacons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And there's no like divine revelation that says this is okay, whatever. They just assume that they can delegate part of their authority and they only delegate part right so they say we're going to still be preaching so we're going to be the ones to explain you know the the gospel mm-hmm. uh, so they're going to retain this kind of interpretation you know function but they say we don't need to be you know just serving tables or whatever so we're going to delegate that to the deacons um 
And so one thing I would say about this also ties into kind of that this structure of, you know, bishop, priest and deacon. Um, people sometimes argue about that. Well, where's you know, where's this threefold structure? And I think you can't argue that it actually is there in the New Testament. But even if it wasn't, I would just say it's just part of the same idea that you can delegate your authority and you can delegate part of your authority. So in the same way that they just delegated sort of certain functions to the deacons, if they want to, they can delegate certain functions to priests, but reserve certain functions for themselves. And that's really what you have in in the Orthodox Church, right, is priests can kind of do everything except ordain mm -hmm. priests and, and bishops. And the way that you, by the way, it, you know, an interesting, another interesting parallel, the way that you ordain a rabbi uh, is you have to have three rabbis together to lay hands on someone to ordain the new rabbi. And that's what you do with bishops in the Orthodox Church. You have to have three bishops to all lay hands on the one bishop, right? Um, and so it's the same sort of structure and the same uh, issue too with like, if you have sort of minor issues, you would go to your priest or your bishop, but for a bigger, more serious issue, they have to have a council. And what's a council? Well, it's at least three bishops, just like the bet then is at least three rabbis, right? Mm -hmm. So there's these exactly parallel sort of, sort of structures. And that's one reason why I, I, did become Orthodox and not Catholic is because there's not really anything in Judaism like um, a papacy, right? There's no sort of single head. There's a conciliar or synodal sort of model, and it's the same structure in uh, in in Orthodoxy. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's basically what I would say that you know. So it, it's you know in Judaism you don't ha at least in in Orthodox Judaism uh, you don't have um, you don't have a papacy, right? But you also don't have just kind of a free for all where just anyone can interpret the the Torah and, and issue halacha themselves. Right. And also, you don't. I mean, you know, Jews wouldn't say that uh, that they're infallible necessarily. It's just sort of kind of like once precedent has been set, that's the precedent that's that's been set, right? That's that's mm -hmm. how we do things now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's a similar sort of issue, like with the Supreme Court. It's like, um, you know, the Supreme Court could overturn the Supreme Court, but a lower court can't. Even if a lower court, you know, if you're a judge in a lower court, you might think that the Supreme Court really made a bad decision on some case. But you just say, yeah, but, you know, that's the way the authority structure is. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the because um, you do, you know, if you want to have a functioning community. Um, it can't just sort of be a free for all, right? Like it couldn't, it wouldn't work to have like the constitution and a bunch of laws, but like we all just interpret the laws for ourselves, right? Like that, that delves is, into chaos real quick. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to have some sort of, some sort of system, you know, some, some idea of who's, and like, you know, like I would say frequently, uh, I think the Supreme Court interprets the constitution incorrectly on, <laughs> <laughs> of issues but like i don't i mean i but i understand like we have to have a system right where i mean someone has to have the final say um right. even if they even they get it wrong right. um anyway that get, kind of gets into other issues about infallibility and whatever. if i can Bo, let me ask you yeah. this because you were talking about jesus delegating authority to the apostles do you think because jesus does that that sets the precedent for the apostles to delegate authority in some sense anyway, maybe an aspect of it uh, that sets the precedent for the apostles to delegate authority to those whom they choose. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying is that's exactly, okay. the, I mean, that's the system in Judaism is that rabbis can ordain new rabbis. Right. right? Um, and the, and the new rabbi has the same, you know, is, is equal in authority to any other rabbi. Right. And it looks like the same thing. Jesus is just saying, you know, just like the the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, they have this authority to to issue halakha, to make decisions about how to interpret the Torah. So mm -hmm. you have to follow that. But they get that from Moses, right? It's the spirit right. of Moses has been sent down this chain. And, and I, it just looks like what Jesus is doing with... You know, even the whole symbolism of taking 12 disciples to represent the 12 tribes and then the 70 apostles, like the 70 elders, mm -hmm. you know. It's like a head nod and affirmation <laughs> to what Moses did there. Yeah, it's just kind yeah. of like he's starting a new Israel, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, but, but instead of 
Moses, it's Jesus, right? Right. Which is obviously a higher, higher authority. Amen. Uh, so yeah, that's how I see it. Is it just kind of, it, it just seems so obviously supposed to be this parallel thing. And um and another thing I I that I mean, I guess is a little bit off topic of Sola Scriptura, but you know, you, you don't see in in the Old Testament, right? There's plenty of times when Israel, um, it, you know, is is doing all kinds of things it shouldn't be doing. I mean, it down to even worshiping false gods, right? Worshiping mm -hmm. like literally putting idols in the temple and worshiping idols in the temple, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a commandment, you know, if you are a male Jew, uh, you have to go to Jerusalem to the temple three times a year, and you have to make a sacrifice. Uh, and that's never like abrogated. There's never a revelation from a prophet or something that says, oh, well, because they're all screwed up and they're doing everything wrong, it doesn't count anymore. And you should just kind of make sacrifices at home or we should start our own temple or something like that. Right. It's just like that's the temple. So you you have to go there and don't worship the idols while you're there. But <laughs> but you still you know, I mean, that's still that's still Israel and that's still the temple. Right. Um, there's, there's no, there's no such thing as Protestantism in the old Testament. Right. I mean, the closest thing you get to, it would be something like the Samaritans, right. Who start their own temple. But, um, I mean, even, even Jesus in the new Testament is just like, yeah, salvation's from the Jews, not the, you know, when he's talking to the Samaritan woman, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, yeah. Salvation. That's us. <laughs> 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 but um yeah i mean you know first go to the samaritans then to the gentiles right so sure. first jews then the samaritans then again but um but yeah it just seems, Bo, seems like Bo, doesn't he also say that there's a time where you won't have to go to this temple or that temple but you'll worship me in spirit and truth yeah that seems very protestant <laughs> uh it, it doesn't to me uh, here's That's i guess fine. here's why um because if you notice, right, in the book of Acts, um, and, and this is after the resurrection, so it's after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the ascension, um, even after Pentecost, right, um, the the disciples were worshiping in the temple. Uh, and and you don't do anything in, in the temple except offer sacrifices, right? Well, they also preached in the temple, right? So, like... Uh, yeah, and they it, and 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 yeah. also at that time, Gentiles also couldn't go into uh the inner parts of the temple still right. either. I would say that they were they were probably doing that, uh, probably up to 70 AD anyway, because well, could I come Christ in? hadn't done that judge final judgment on Jerusalem yet that I think he was predicting. So, I mean, you could look at it from that way too, I think. So, uh, but no, Jay, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. No, I am right. a host here. I'm not. I don't want to <laughs> step no, I mean, on you guys, to, man. To your you guys point are also. There, I would say that even though Jesus says that it will not be in this temple alone that you would worship uh, the Father, we do find in the even in the New Testament text, and even in places you might not expect, like the Book of Hebrews, for example, Hebrews 13, which is about, as you know, what, what elements are fulfilled in the New Testament. Hebrews doesn't get rid of the notion of an altar. In fact, in Hebrews 13, Paul says that we have an altar from which okay. those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So altar sacrifice and eating is still very important in the New Testament church's worship, which he identifies with the heavenly Jerusalem. For us, when the apocalypse uh, is revealed to John and he sees this ordered liturgical worship service in heaven, you look at Revelations 4, 5, and 6, you notice he sees all the incense. He sees people wearing vestments, elders. He sees angels. It looks very much like an Orthodox church service because for us, the divine liturgy is that celebration of the heavenly worship on earth. So while it's true that Jesus is saying to the woman, the Samaritan woman, if you think about her context or her dispute with the Jews, it was precisely over the question of where should we worship God? She says, Jacob's well. Jesus says, no, sorry, it was at the temple. That was the theologically correct position. However, a time is coming when the whole world will worship God in spirit and in truth. That just means in the Holy Spirit, right? It's not saying that there won't be specific places that we gather to that are holy. In fact, the New Testament includes the notions of certain locations actually being holy. Peter says in his epistle, 
that Jesus was transfigured on the holy mountain. We know that in the Gospels, right, we have the, the, the pool where the angel stirs in the Gospel of John, the pool. So it's a holy, a holy site. So altars, holy things, which are typically kind of contrary to the Protestant idea of, well, that's all fulfilled. That's all Old Testament ceremonies. We don't have holy things anymore. There's many, many, many instances, I would say, where we find this carried over in the New Testament. I, I was going to to finish what I was going to say. I, it, it, when they go to the temple, right, you you typically do offer a sacrifice in the temple, right? And if you think about it theologically, it would be it would make no sense to to be offering blood sacrifices, right, or offerings for sin. Um, but if you if you're familiar with the sacrificial system, right, the the one uh, one offering that is not in any way connected with sin and it doesn't involve a blood sacrifice is the thank offering or the Eucharist, right? Which is also specifically leavened bread. Um, <laughs> that's another whole other issue, but, but it's interesting, you know, a lot of times people don't think about this. They think, Oh, well, this sacrificial system has been sort of done away with because Christ is the final, you know, sacrifice for our sins. But there is a sacrifice that's still left, right? That is not a sacrifice for sins, um, and it's it's the bread offering, right? The grain offering or the thank offering. Um, and in in the book of Acts, what you read is that the disciples would go to the temple every day, um, and then it says they would go home and break bread from house to house. And if you know about the the thank offering, it would be uh, it, it would be a pretty substantial amount of bread and the the commandment says that you can't let any of it um uh, you can't leave any of it over for the for the next day uh and and the idea there is partly that you would um you would then be sort of incentivized to to feed hungry people or invite people to come and, and share it because you can't um you can't leave any of it over, right? So you have to, and you you have to make a big amount. So you have to share it with people. So it looked, I mean, it looks very much like, I mean, they're they're going to the temple to to worship, and that's you would normally think where you would offer a sacrifice. And then it specifically says they go they go home and break bread uh, from house to house. So it looks very much like the Eucharist, and it looks like they're still doing that, you know, in the temple and in a sacrificial sort of way, like with the Old Testament temple liturgy of the grain offering. Um, and then, of course, once the temple is destroyed, um, they uh, and and presumably in, you know, outside of Jerusalem and other places, they would just celebrate that on on their own. Um, but it doesn't look to me, I mean, uh, you know, you, you still have to have someone sort of, again, delegated to um, to do that, to make that, that offering. Right. And it doesn't seem to me that there's any indication that it's just, again, kind of a free for all, like anyone can just consecrate the Eucharist or whatever, um, that I see anyway. Right. I appreciate that. But David, is there any follow-up, uh, since you brought up or, okay. All right. Let's shift gears then, uh, for a minute. So, we recently did uh, on Faith Unaltered a couple shows. Um, one entitled "Why We're Orthodox," the other entitled "Why We're Protestant." And Dale, unfortunately, being a Protestant, uh, so he had some uh, issues going on uh, while we were doing that first episode, and so he actually had came uh, back on uh, the uh, the podcast uh, in order to give his side of the story. And, and there's a quote that I want to, I want to read and I want to get Jay, I want to get your opinion on it. And, uh, Dr. Branson, I want to get your opinion on it as well. But in this episode, he says, uh, Dell says this, he says, quote, we have the Protestant Bible, 39 books in the old Testament, as well as the 27 books in the new Testament and Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and Protestants all agree that these books are in the canon. Therefore, great. Protestants win the debate and can use the 66 books as a standard to assess any other later books, doctrines, or traditions that may come up. And as I get into the fourth topic, I'll say that I think some Orthodox and Catholic doctrines and other books are inconsistent with the Protestant Bible, end quote. What would your guys' response be specifically to the understanding that because we all agree on the 66 books, 
Therefore, the Protestants win the debate by default, and Orthodox and Roman Catholics would need to justify you know, our other books. I'll just qualify. Go ahead, Dale. Because so that wasn't an argument for Protestantism in all of its full in all of its doctrines. It was mere. That was an argument for mere Protestantism being mm -hmm. the, the default. So, uh, yeah, over to you guys to answer that. Yeah, Jay, if you want to take this one first, you can. Well, my first sense would be that it's uh, fallacious reasoning because. The fact that we all three agree on something would really have nothing to do with its status in terms of whether it's true or false. And I mean, I, I hear a lot of people arguing all the time that, um, you know, people say, well, the churches don't agree. So how do you how can what you're saying uh, be the be the case if, if all the churches and the different groups that they all disagree? So why should we believe you? Well, it's kind of premise on the same kind of reasoning that the status of agreement or disagreement really has nothing to do whatsoever with whether this list or that list is correct uh, or false. So that's number one, a fallacy. Um, I would say that the, 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 another point would be that, well, if there's divine revelation in those other texts, then it really, again, doesn't matter <laughs> how far we scale it down or how much like it's a question of what the divine revelation in toto is right so it, it, there's not this is really irrelevant to what the the content of divine re revelation is what groups accept or reject what it's a question of what is that content what is that divine revelation so that is going to be known again only through some kind of historical attestation of a historical body that preserved it and decided you know what what the book would be and it doesn't matter like how many Protestant groups kind of come along and say, well, I like this can and I like this can. And it, it really ends up being kind of something that any individual Protestant could conceivably construct on his own. Because if the Protestant idea of not being bound by anybody else's interpretation, the, the right to private interpretation, the right to freedom of conscience and so forth in these matters, then what on what basis? Everybody probably knows that, you know, Luther disagreed or doubted certain books. Let's say for the sake of argument, Luther said, I, I reject the Catholic epistles and the book of Revelation. On what basis can a Protestant really say, well, you don't have the authority to do that? Because it doesn't really matter what, if, if the Protestant position is right, it's premised on the notion that it doesn't matter what any historical group said what the canon of scripture was. So the fact that we all agree on it is really irrelevant to the Protestant presupposition of the right of private interpretation and the authority of the individual to basically, I've done my own research. I've prayed a lot about it, by the way. I always, I like to propose this, this uh, thought experiment to Protestants when this comes up. I just simply say, mm -hmm. what would you say to me if I said, I've done a lot of praying and the Holy Spirit has led me. Trust me, I've read a lot of conservative scholars and I believe the only acceptable book in the New Testament is just the book of Jude. That's it. So sorry, you're all wrong, but I want to know, like, on what basis would you say that that's wrong? Because I can appeal ultimately to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to my own personal striving for truth, what typically a lot of Protestants appeal to. But if we don't have any normative authority, as we say, in terms of a philosophy, right, within history, mm -hmm. how are we going to, how are we going to, on what, how would we adjudicate that position being wrong or Luther throwing out certain, you know, five, six books of the New Testament? Like, why? would that be wrong oh yeah are you asking um yeah so the way the way we're warranted i would say is is in the same way as the almost in the same way as the orthodox position according to father jonathan and i know from what you said it sounds like you have some differences with him but um it's, I, mean, it's, I don't know who you're talking about he's an orthodox priest he's been on the show a couple times but he, he basically, father jonathan ivanov Father Jonathan. I, I'm not familiar with him. I don't. What? What? what how do you know I had differences? So, so at, at the end of the day, the way it's warranted. Look, we appeal to the Holy Spirit. This provides us with a warranted true belief with respect to, you know, hold the on. This. Hold and, on, hold on. So, but appealing to the Holy Spirit, as I was arguing, it can give. That's the ultimate thing that every individual will rely on. Mm -hmm. But when we raise the question of normative authority and delusion that shifts out of just the individual existential experience domain into the public domain. And that involves history, right? So on well, what basis would you say that any Protestant with a different canon 
is wrong or in delusion because we're going to have to appeal to some historical normative authority, right? That's different yeah. than existential uh, assurance. Those are two different categories. They're related, but they're different. So two, so two responses. So in the first place, on the individual level, um, remember, I said warrant, not justification. Warrant is, uh, carries with it a factive component as an epistemic criterion. So uh, under Alvin planting his definition of warrant, it, it entails that if we're warranted, then the belief is in fact true. Uh, so that's just the part of the definition of warrant uh, and that it just comes down to you. Do, do you know internally uh, whether you're warranted or not? Um, yeah, but, but that's not, but I was talking about the public notion of normativity as distinct from the individual subjective assurance, two different okay. things. Okay, so maybe I think I might be answering you with the second more objective argument. And this is where I was trying to say, I, I'm kind, kind of like you guys, but a bit different in that I would say, look, it's the uh, this the Holy Spirit acting upon in true individual Christians across denominations over time, over all of time. And but hold yeah. on. So for us, for example, the list of canon that we accept would be Trollo slash uh, Sixth Council, right? So do, do you think that there's a, another way to identify the biblical canon than that historical process? I, th I think that there, yeah, I think that there is. I think it's it's just basically the Holy Spirit working within the individual. So there's not any public way to adjudicate between competing Holy Spirit claims. The only, the only, the only way to do that is by saying that I think that the majority of cr true Christians over time have all accepted these books. And well, on but, that front, there's only... But the again, Protestant that's presupposing that. that Protestants, Orthodox, and Roman Catholics are all true Christians. And so how do you know you have the right definition or category well, of what... Who? I mean, are Mormons, right? Are they excluded, presumably, right? Yeah, they, they would be excluded. So, so that, but wouldn't they be excluded in part because they don't have the Nicene teaching of the Trinity? Yeah, that's exactly why I would deny them. Okay, so, but does that mean that you accept the Council of Nicaea? I, yeah, I, I believe that the Council of Nicaea more or less has true propositions. I don't think it's inspired or, or anything or infallible or anything, but... Well, what, what, what do you think goes into a council, for example? Do you think it's just the confession that's produced, or what, what do you think is entailed there? Yes, yeah, so, so my understanding, and you kind of, this is why I was asking you before, is I, I thought that the Orthodox view is that when a council comes together, they are almost getting uh, some kind of inspired divine revelation. Well, but I'm asking on your, your perspective, I'm just wondering, because you said I accept Nicaea, but when I go to the canons of Nicaea, I mean, they teach probably 20 things that you don't believe. Are you are you familiar with those things? Uh, probably not. No, I'm just thinking of the Trinity aspect of it. So okay, well, wait a minute. So but Nicaea and then the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed says, for example, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And mm -hmm. I would argue that it makes sense to interpret that the way the people that wrote it, right, meant it. So for example, Cappadocian theology, Basil Nissa, when they wrote One Holy Catholic Apostolic Church there for the creed, they're referring to the visible mm -hmm. Episcopal structure that is attending those councils, right? They were bishops. They did the Eucharist, right? The Canons of Nicaea talk about the Eucharist. It talks about giving the Eucharist to the dead. It talks about feasts. It talks about virgins. It talks about all of these things that Protestants don't accept. So when you say, well, I accept Nicaea, Nicaea is predicated on a kind of historic authority. So it, you're not accepting Nicaea. You're saying I accept the Trinity, not the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, uh, it's exactly. I think you said it was your second point that you gave in your opening, where I, I would take the view as a Protestant. Look, I'm accepting the true propositions that are that well, are in on. there. So yeah. now it's not the Council of Nicaea, and it's not even. It's not. It's you're right. Not the right. The creed that's produced by the first and second councils, right? So it's the not the creed. Of the creed that I like. Sorry, the part of the creed that you like. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I agree with you as a as a historian. We would want to understand what the uh, people meant. And okay, for the sake of argument, maybe they meant a visible universal church. 
I disagree with them. I think that there's an invisible universal church, so I would reject that part of the council. So, yeah, so I, I am subscribing. Only well, it's interesting time. because we don't, but see, through these centuries then, what you're saying is the true Christian appeared at first to be aligned with Nicaea and people's public confession, but now it's getting scaled down, right? What? Oh, no, actually, it's not what you guys are saying. You guys are not actually a true church. It was what that would amount to. At least the classical reformers, many of them were consistent enough to say that the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches are, are not true churches. So is a true Christian now the per and this is this was your measure of then whose canon of scripture we accept, you see that it's getting whittled down to basically just being Protestantism. So it's assuming the thing the thing that was in question. Um so so in terms of okay so to start off let me, let me rephrase it like this and I don't mean to cut you off but so basically you're saying that the canon of scripture is determined by what the true Christians at all times believe. The true Christians at all times believe the propositions out of Nicaea that affirm Protestantism that I adhere to. So basically, it's just restating your position of what Protestant Christianity is, is now scaled down to what a true Christian is. The canon then is just what the Protestant canon was. But none of that, all of that is just a big circle. So I wouldn't say necessarily all of true Christianity. I'm just saying kind of it's an argument that the default is one way we can identify which doctrines are true Christianity is that the majority of Christians uh, across sects or denom different sects and denominations over time subscribe to it. And only the Protestants... Well, hold on. But in the Arian crisis, the big contention of Nicaea, Arian, uh, Orthodoxy was in the far in the minority. So would that make Arian and semi-Arianism true because it was the majority at the time of Nicaea? Well, there's been about 1,700 years where Arianism is not the majority view. So, well, but I'm saying let's just take your position and imagine that we're a Christian in the year 300. Well, how, how would you on your principles? How would we know where the where the the true delineator between a true Christian and a false Christian is? Well, we'll see that. Okay, so at that time, uh, we might have an issue, right? But I'm I'm saying, for me right now, well, doesn't your position have to be true from the beginning? I mean. No, it, I'm saying we have a mechanism today as Protestants to know um, that just so it's not the same mechanism Protestantism works now. It wouldn't it wouldn't have worked for the first several centuries. Yeah, they would have had another mechanism to tell at that time because. And, yeah, and that would be what I mean. Yeah. So is that this is basically an admission yes. that the first several centuries of the church is not the Protestant church, right? No, uh, again, it wouldn't have been Protestantism. It is then. biblical it Christianity. Um, well, sorry, it was biblical Christianity at this point, but they don't have access to a clear canon and no way to really recognize the true and the false church is what you were admitting. No, I, I'm I'm saying so they had a different mechanism right through the Holy Spirit of recognizing which scriptures uh, in the first century. They, they also had and what is this mechanism and what do you have any evidence of this from history or what, you're just sort of asserting this? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying like. No, I mean, saying, Jay, you're kind of leading him too. Um, let him answer first. Let's let's see what he's got to say in a roundabout way first. So, well, he's asserted him. the mechanism. I just want to know what. Uh, yeah. What it is. So, so okay, let Jay. Let me ask you a yes or no question. Would you accept that there could be additional mechanisms that apply today that maybe didn't apply back then that are valid, like progressive revelation or something? Yeah. Are you saying like? that we today because of information the internet we have access to mechanisms for determining things in history that they didn't have then is that what you're getting at well no because the original question that tyler asked is my my mere protestantism as the default so it's an it's an argument that i had and the principle of how do i how do we discern that today is that okay well for two thousand well, years uh the majority of christians across denominations or sects all accept these 66 protestant books some of them accept others uh additional ones but everyone agrees on these so we can say at least these we know are inspired but why would the majority acceptance somehow equate to the proposition that therefore those are the true books that's what i'm i'm calling into question the assumption there basically oh, okay and by okay. the way what exactly was the mechanism? I, I didn't hear that. You, oh, the, you, the you responded with a two quoque, uh, but what was the mechanism? 
uh, it's the Holy Spirit producing properly basic beliefs with respect to these books and their status over over time across the denominations. So, in fact, in the third, fourth, and fifth century, the true Christians did know the canon of Scripture. Yeah, I, I think yeah, for the most part. I mean, how see, if many I, of them couldn't read and many of them didn't have access to a full canon of Scripture? Were they somehow knowing in these centuries before the canon actually came to be, which is the consensus of basically every Protestant scholar? How were they knowing the canon of Scripture? Yeah, so I think I think you're right that the that the people who were illiterate couldn't read it for themselves, but they could have that it was read, most of them, right? They, they could have it read to them. Um, and in that case, they recognize the word of God that's being read to them. But at the local churches, as I showed from Lee McDonald, many of them didn't have the full 66 books, nor the full Orthodox canon eventually, which comes about by the sixth council. So what I'm saying is what's the mechanism by which they're supposed to know the canon of scripture, which by, I'm just saying by necessity, they can't know that you see. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, of course. I, I don't think any Christian in the first century knew the full canon of the New Testament. Well, say the third century. So remember, this was supposed to delineate true and false Christians. And you're saying that it's the lowest common denominator of people who believed in the things that were taught in Scripture, but they didn't even know what the Scriptures were because they didn't have access to a full canon. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So the average guy in the year 300, shouldn't the means of salvation be the same for somebody saved in the year 300? To somebody saved in the year 2023 um not not necessarily so the means of salvation yes the conditions for salvation but not necessarily the means of learning that that's that's what i was trying to argue is that today we have an additional mechanism that i think warrants my my protestant default argument uh and you're right i that that type of argument wouldn't necessarily apply for christians in 380 or before so I would need to postulate some other mechanism like the Holy Spirit, James White type type argument, and we can debate that. So But how yeah. but doesn't it matter which canon we have, whether it's right or wrong? Right. Well, I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, no one in the so first I thought the, I thought the canon was part of true and false Christians. So now but it's no, not it's not an essential uh belief necessarily. The way the way I well it's indirect. So I could conceivably scale it down to just the book of Jude? So the way so the way I determine the essential, you know, you're you're a damned heretic versus you're a Christian, a true Christian is from the Bible. So it, it's whatever the Bible explains. But the question originally was, what are the contents of the Bible? So that's being assumed in that answer. <clears throat> exactly. It's implicit that you need to know what the what the criteria are. So on and that's that, what we're here to talk about. So, you know, we can't just say, well, it's the Bible. The Bible is the Bible. How do we know what books are the right list of books? For example, and the reason this matters is a point that, for example, Luther makes. Luther makes the point that, well, I definitely don't want Maccabees and Sirach and some of these other deuterocanonical texts in there because they give credence to the notion of uh, prayers for the dead. They give credence to the notion of works going up as a memorial before God. Um, so, you know, for Luther, it was very important to exclude those because the three, the theological presuppositions that Luther had to set works and law and grace and law in a dialectic couldn't allow for texts that could be supportive of what he was arguing against Catholics, right? So in other words, his theological presuppositions determined for him the canon of scripture. And I'm just saying that it seems to me that Protestant position would be a lot more honest if it was, and I'm not calling you out or saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying... Know. If we were to say that, look, you know, ultimately Protestantism's view of the canon presupposes Protestantism. That that's kind of the point. I'm not okay. I, I need to think that over. I'm not sure that it presupposes it, but I, yeah, like. Uh, can, I, can I just interject one thing that it's it's not the case that everyone agrees on those sixty six books, too. So, I think that's something you're maybe not taking into account like the uh, machine, it doesn't have uh second third john or uh, second peter there's an armenian canon of scripture that doesn't have a few of the books um i mean so there are there are new testament canons uh, and old testament canons that are that are smaller than the protestant canon. yeah but the majority of of christians over time across I mean, the majority why are we supposed to, to I mean, are roman catholics aren't they 
Yeah. So we should just be Roman Catholic. No, no I'm, I'm just saying that's we can accept what what the majority of those Christians across denominations accept. On what basis? Because Roman Catholicism. Yeah. You know, what scripture is, right? On what basis are we supposed to adopt the majority position argument? That seems to come prepackaged with assumptions, basically. Well, I think because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit. So this is now we're back to the Bible, and I'm asking. I think the, I think the bottom that. line of it is, it, I I don't think we're getting a non-circular definition, right? Isn't that? I mean, it yeah. seems like we're sort of defining the Bible in terms of what true Christians believe, but then how we determine who's a true Christian is going to be partly determined by what's in the Bible. Which amounts to a Protestant reading. So, If I can interject here real quick, is this, so I watched your debate with Pedro, Jay, is this the same line of argumentation that Pedro is using that it, I don't know, it took a little bit of the debate and, and he still really didn't grasp uh, what you and even the audience was trying to show him in his circular reasoning. Is that kind of the same thing that's going on here or, or am I off? There was a point, I think, in the debate where Pedro did uh, go down this line of thought. I remember two specific points that he made. I think one of them was this point, which I was just, again, trying to say, well, look, <clears throat> you know, it's fine to say these things, but when we actually dig into what is meant by those things, it turns out to really just be a restatement of the original proposition, which would just be a circle, basically. So, um, and by the way, I'm not being unfair because I would say, for example, in a lot of Roman Catholic debates I've had, Roman Catholics would say something like, well, look, the only way to know the Bible is through the office of the papacy. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what books are supposed to be in that collection. And they'll just sort of default to, again, those Augustinian, Demasian, uh, Pope Damasus synods and say, well, see, this is how we know. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, it's they'll say, well, the reason we know the papacy is true is because of Matthew 16. Mm -hmm. So Matthew 16 is confirmed by the papacy, but the papacy is known because it's confirmed by, by Matthew 16. And that's a circle. And if a person does want to make a circular argument, then, OK, that would be consistent with a certain type of epistemology. But 99.9 percent .9 of Protestants and Roman Catholics want to have a type of an evidentialist, uh, you know, foundationalist epistemology approach. And so that's going right. to be difficult, I would say, for them to tease out. But yeah. Uh, and then Pedro had another argument about divine artifact, which was that if God from all eternity knew the canon, then the canon, the uh, six, six books, the Protestant canon was predetermined in the divine mind or something like that, which is it just ignores the historical realities of the fact that, yeah, but it didn't just drop into our lap. Like the, the book and its transmission and its history has a, has a formative process in these centuries of the church. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I would argue that if we want to have a lowest common denominator of Christianity, then it's going to be the same doctrines and dogmas that were, requ were, were required in these centuries. And when we go to those centuries and we find the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed as the, the, the basis for what you would have to believe and would you'd be catechized in, and we can go and read, for example, St. Cyril of Jerusalem when he, when he does catechesis, the catechetical lecture is very famous uh, uh, patristic corpus it's modeled on the creed so he just exposits in a catechetical way the teachings of the creed and this is the this is the bishop of jerusalem this is and this is consistent with what the other bishoprics in christendom are teaching mm -hmm. so they're expositing and teaching these things the way that we as orthodox exposit and teach them teach them so this idea that you can give verbal credence to these centuries and then when we actually dig into it, we find out that it's it's not really Creedus because most Protestants, most evangelicals would not have anything to do with the actual church where Athanasius was at. Mm -hmm. Right. They would they would be running him out or he would be running them out. <laughs> right. Oh. So that's the reality of the situation. And in fact, a lot of Protestantism actually matches up to a conglomeration of many early church heresies. There's elements of Marcionism, elements of Gnosticism, elements of Massalianism, Montanism. I mean, depending on what Protestant we're talking about, we actually have precedent in a lot of these heterodox groups, even in Irenaeus's day. When Irenaeus in 180 writes about, you know, what doctrines are necessary to join the church, right, as a bishop, if mm -hmm. you're going to join my church. Uh, you're going to believe in the tradition, he says, in book three of Against Heresies, that aligns with the apostolic succession. And he says one of those great churches is the Church of Rome, which, because of Peter and Paul, has a lot of honor. And he says mm -hmm. we, ought, we, we ought to look to them as an example of a church that we should want to be in communion with. 
and that we should base our apostolic succession principles on, right? Mm -hmm. The way that Rome does apostolic succession is a model for how the true churches are recognized through apostolic succession and the tradition that they confess. Okay. So his appeals are to tradition, apostolic succession in 180, mm -hmm. again, for the or orthodox normative church of that time. So the, the point is just that if Protestantism is not a historical reality, then there's at some point a division, a divorcing, a loss of what the, and it really doesn't matter what flavor Protestant it is. You're ultimately going to have to come back to some kind of uh, blackout view, right? So the apostles lay down the, the, the positive faith. And then depending upon which Protestant we're talking to, right? It's, well, it was all blackout or, well, they had a lot of good, but a lot of bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of like, well, why are people who are basically heretical, the ones that are preserving and determining the canon of scripture, right? right. It, se it seems to not really make sense, given the fact that you might argue that in the Old Testament, okay, so the Jews were often heretical, uh, they fell into heresy, but the church is different from Old Testament Israel. So Protestants like to use Old Testament Israel as a model, but we can't absolutize the period of the Old Testament because the reality has come to replace the type and the foreshadowing. So, for example, the, re the, the, the what circumcision did was a type, and baptism is the reality. And when a lot of Protestants, for example, have a, a, a take issue with the church fathers and baptismal regeneration, which they universally teach, mm -hmm. the argument will be, well, let's go back to the mode of operation of the Holy Spirit during the Old Testament, because circumcision didn't uh, affect spiritually what it signifies. Therefore, baptism shouldn't. But this is to take the Old Testament modus operandi and absolutize that as if, there's not a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament precisely on sacraments and the Holy Spirit. And there is because Christ said with Pentecost, mm -hmm. right, it's a whole new thing, right? right? Pentecost is a huge fulfillment of the Old Testament feast of Pentecost and weeks. Mm -hmm. So it it's the reality of which those things were the types. So we can't go back to the types, but much of Protestantism is predicated on this point on returning to typological and shadow realities. I gotcha. I gotcha. So let me ask you this real quick, and then we, we can just uh, have another discussion around. The By the way, is why baptism and yeah. the real presence are so important. Bachelor regeneration and the real presence. Right on. Right on. I appreciate that. So <laughs> let me ask you this and forgive me. I just want to make sure that I've got this down and, and our audience has got this down as well. So if you were to answer the questions that you asked Dale specifically about understanding and knowing what exactly the canon is, how would you uh, and, and you can be brief if you want to. Um, how would you argue non uh, without begging the question? Uh, how what would your answer look like? Uh, like I said, without begging the question. Yeah, we have to go to the historical testimony and witness of the church fought. So the, I would say the internal evidence of Scripture that it doesn't tell us what books make up the book of the Bible. Right. There are cross textual references, sure, between different authors citing other authors. Mm -hmm. and different authors citing certain old testament books but if that is is if pure citation is somehow canonicity then well now we've got the you know, book of enoch being cited so uh, and no pagan problem. philosophers right sure uh yeah. <laughs> and we also have um well again we, we we don't we don't have throughout the roman empire in the seas of the early church we don't have a consistent canon we have varying mm -hmm. canons of uh, varying lengths but we do have a body of oral teaching that accompanies the interpretive the, those texts because texts don't just stand on their own. This is another thing that I think Protestantism rests on this um, enlightenment and, 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 and post printing press notion or something, this weird idea that the text just means what it says and it says what it means. Mm. But texts don't operate that way. Texts require an interpretive matrix, a schema. Mm -hmm. a, a, a web of beliefs that we have about that text and each text is situated within the rest of the text mm -hmm. and they don't really make sense without the holistic context and i think most protestants believe in canonical interpretation and holistic exegesis sure but even the bible itself i'm saying it doesn't make sense without the milieu and the context of the church you see right because the church is the pillar and ground of truth Timothy said, it says to Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, not the other way around, right? Paul says to the Thessalonians, continue to keep the traditions, whether oral or written. And again, those are just really, I think, points bolstering what we're saying, which is that the Bible is a, is situated within a context, a milieu 
of the life of the church, the liturgical life of the church. It's meant to be, meant to be heard and exposited by an authority figure and a, a structure. And you can't have that divorced from the actual history of the church. So the way that I get around a, a circular argument would be that, mm -hmm. well, just simply that the history of the church, we can go into these guys up here, demonstrates that there's no clear canon. Uh, it varies in, in, amongst many centuries. Tradition is seen by these guardians of the text as necessary for the text. Mm -hmm. uh, that's who makes this final authoritative decision for us as Orthodox. Uh, so that to me is consistent uh, as a system. Okay, right on. Uh, Bo, is there anything that you would like to add to what Jay just said? And then I want to get Dane's uh, opinion on, on some of this stuff because you've been very quiet, bro. And uh, I'm getting worried about you over there. So <laughs> I'm listening, man. Right. Yeah, I know, so right? When, when there's smarter people in the room, just sit back and listen, right? Be a sponge, right? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Go ahead, Bo. No, no, I don't have anything I think to add for now. Okay. All right. Uh, Dane. So um, Dale said something that I, I would uh, like to hear uh, Jay or Dr. Branson's opinion on, uh, talking about how in the scriptures um, and from a sola scriptura perspective, you can get this list of primary uh, doctrines. And I'm, you know, I'm skeptical that that's true. Um, I think, first of all, people give different definitions of what is primary, you know. Um, but second of all, the scriptures don't necessarily give a list. Um, this is primary. This is secondary. This you have to believe. Uh, yeah. This you can have liberty of, of opinion. So what is y'all's response when you hear a Protestant say um, Sola Scriptura can provide all the primary doctor doctrines? Um I, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I know you would disagree, but well, one, uh, I would say that the Protestant position is easily self-refuting on that point because if sola scriptura is a primary doctrine, sola scriptura can't provide the canon of scripture necessary for sola scriptura. So that's one primary doctrine that it can't provide. Um, certainly, the New Testament teaches the doctrine of the Trinity as it reads the Old Testament, but whether or not this is completely clearly evident just from the exegesis of the scripture i think it's it, there's a there's a development in the sense of explication of the doctrine of the trinity and the other christological doctrines which are implicit in the scriptures but the way that the the church exposes them utilizing a lot of philosophical concepts and things that are extra canonical um various insights from platonic neoplatonic aristotelian philosophy later on i mean those things are very helpful and they kind of become part of the uh, expression of the church, the mindset of the church, but the, none of those things are contained in the scriptures. And so to me, it's just kind of, I mean, explicitly, right? Like, I don't know, something like uh, the, the fifth council's doctrine of inhypostatized. The idea we could say is in scripture, but that express that, that specific uh, terminology and, and the expression that, it, that it's encapsulating that we see in the Leontii, that's not in scripture. So, you know, there's so many things like this that I think when we put it in context historically, it makes it makes so much more sense that it's not really these texts. It's a group of people. The community is the body of Christ's expression, the word, right? The living word. We're the living word. Doesn't mean that the texts aren't important or that they're, they're not in another sense, the word. But jesus is calling us to more than just abstract propositional knowledge post enlightenment reformation but actual participation and the protestant devaluing of sacramentology i think contributes to that idea that the highest faculty in man is propositional knowledge and this kind of stuff and that's all just really a movement away from a, a visible social living community Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Branson, is there anything you wanted to add on that? Um, could you kind of rephrase the question for me? So, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious your response to Protestants who claim that uh, scripture alone uh, can give it, uh, can give us the primary doctrines, the things that must be believed for a person to be saved. I, the, the main thing I think uh, when I think of a question like that, I mean, you know, so of course it could. Um, and I, I apologize for 
<laughs> but it, it just seems like such a crazy idea to me to think that that actually is is true that like that's how the bible is written it, it's always it, i mean really even when i was a protestant i i remember when i was a, a baptist like as a kid sometimes people would i don't know if they were joking or if they were serious but you know they'd be like the they'd refer to the bible they'd be like this is like the instruction manual for your life and, and i always i mean even as like a you know teenager i was like this is a really poorly written <laughs> instruction, you know, like, like there, it's not arranged by topic. There's no index. Like it's <laughs> like, they're just like, that's just not at all how it's written. Um, it just, it's always struck me as a really crazy idea to think that the Bible is supposed to be um, like this, you know, people talk about the clarity of scripture and it just seems um, I, I just, I can't, I can't figure out why anyone would think that unless they just had to, like, if, unless they were forced into it by, you know, sort of the system that, that requires it. Cause I mean, I just didn't, I just like, why would you like, why would you read lamentations or something and think, Oh, this is so it's like the summa theologiae over here, you know, just so, so laid out in such a clear system. And it's obviously not. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I like, could you, I guess in theory, like, could you go through the Bible and figure out what are the primary things or something? I mean, I, I guess, but um, I mean, it's certainly not like, I mean, it's obviously not written that way. It just, it's always just struck me as a really weird thing to think. And I don't know what evidence it's based on. Like one. Yeah. So this has been, this has been a real uh, tipping point for me. Cause as, as we were talking before the show, Dr. Branson, um, that I'm, I'm a pastor in the Methodist church. And so I am, you know, Protestant, but I've been really struggling with, uh, with upholding Sola Scriptura for a while now, because uh, this idea that it can provide a list of primary doctrines and then, Usually the definition people will give me is, well, primary doctrine is that which deals with salvation, how a person is saved. Mm -hmm. But Protestants, we don't even agree on that. Right. So uh, yeah. some Protestants would affirm baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, while others would not. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm more on the side of baptismal regeneration and a uh, big proponent of infant baptism. But, uh, you know, a Baptist would disagree with me on that. And I'm like, well, <clears throat> at this point we're two Protestants that disagree on a primary doctrine because this yeah. deals with how a, a man or a woman is saved. Like, so um, I've been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as, uh, I, I'm definitely still, a, you know, believing in the infallibility of scripture and the inspiration mm -hmm. of scripture and the, the, the divine authority of scripture, but sola scriptura is a little too far for me. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's one thing that always struck me when I, when I was a Protestant is, it, you know, I felt like, I mean, either the Bible just is not clear um, or we're all idiots um, or I have to just uh, anyone who really disagrees with me on something serious. I have to just assume that they are evil or uh, be, you know, stubbornly resisting something that is really, you know, but but the reality is it just seems so obvious to me that, um, you know, there are sincere people who just did, you know, sincerely disagree about, um, about some things. And I don't know. Right on guys. Right on. So here's the thing. We are at the two hour mark. I've got one more question left. Um, would you all be interested? And if not, that's okay. Um, I've got one super chat right now, so I would like to get to that, but would you guys be interested in answering audience questions after we wrap with this question? Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll probably jump off, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm in it for your last question for sure. All right, sweet. So if you have a question for Jay, Bo, or the, or the panel, uh, go ahead and send us that. As Josh said in the chat, Super Chats get answered first, uh, and it would really help supporting our ministry as well. So thank you for those. So Jay, I've heard on a few of your videos now that deal with Sola Scriptura that German theologians and scholars after Luther used like higher criticism to dissect the scriptures. Can you give us a brief timeline of the key points of this happening from Luther's time till today? And does the logical outcome of this process result in something akin to what Marcion did in the early second century? 
Well, certainly Luther himself believed that the text of scripture, at least at different points as he saw them canonically, because there seems to be some fluctuations as to what he thinks mm -hmm. is the canon over time. And, and I've read a lot of Luther. I've actually read more Luther than Luther and Calvin than I have any of the other. I haven't read a lot of the second generation Lutherans or whatever, but I kind of had a phase when I was really into Luther. So I got heavy into his ideas when I was 18 or 19. And, um, what, what I see is kind of like a lot of rhetorical flair and a lot of sort of doubting at different phases of what he thinks the canon is. And what I argue when I argue this point, I think people, uh, there are scholars that have made this connection, but um, there's a couple of books that Father John Whiteford recommends that go into this, which if you go watch our stream that we did, he, he, he recommends some of those texts. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that Luther kind of set the stage because he was a kind of a translator textual critic scholar to a degree i mean you translated you know the the luther bible but um the the new the new german new testament but uh the problem i think is that the principle that he lays down of doubting the canonical rule which had been pretty well established in the west for a long time you know up to his time that really set the stage for transferring the Preser preser preservation of the scriptures from the church or some ecclesial entity now it becomes the purview of the university and we see this directly going on with tubigen and the different uh german universities that now take it upon themselves to kind of be the locus of the authority for scripture and the whole of protestantism ends up going in this direction over time it may not have it's not overnight so I, I don't know the exact, you know, like critical scholars, like a generation after Luther, because I've never really followed the, the Lutheran tradition that much. But I can tell you that, you know, I don't think it's accidental that Julius Wellhausen, who is the father of the documentary hypothesis, he's coming out of these schools. And so he's kind of the first to say, um, I'm, I'm going to go on a, a rampaging, you know, quest against anything that has to do with ceremony. So he, he just sort of wants to purge the Bible of anything ceremonial. And this leads to the theory of there being different uh, JEPD, the Yahweh school, the Elois school, priestly school, Deuteronomy school. And, and so now the, the, new, the Old Testament is first on the chopping block to get sort of divided up into this, which is ultimately a denial of the uh, continuity and coherence of the text. But remember, Jesus said, if we accept the Gospel of John, the scripture cannot be broken. So this is a really strong breaking of the scripture because now we're sort of dividing it up into an incoherent jumbling of different competing schools based on the terms that are used, the names of God that are used in different sections. So for example, I'm reading right now a, a rabbinical book uh, on the uh, theophanies and the manifestations of God in the old Testament to, in preparation for the debate that I'm going to do with uh, Daniel Hakikachu, the Muslim guy. Yeah. And the rabbinical texts uh, are interesting because there's a lot of debate and fluid. There's fluidity is the point here. It's like there's not this strict Unitarian view, but a lot of the debate of fluidity centers around the assumption that, well, Deuteronomy doesn't have theophanies, so it's a Deuteronomist text. Um, the priestly text allowed for theophanies because they wanted people to come to where God was embodied in the theophanic presence, right? So, but this is all based on presuppositions, right? So, um, the presuppositions of unbelief typically in critical schools will treat the text as if they're any other text. So the idea is that, well, I have to treat the Bible like any other text and I'm going to subject it to the same quote, scientific evidentialist criticisms of any other religious text or any other literary text. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the rule in the higher textual world. But again, that really just, assumes the bible isn't what it claims to be right because if the bible is what it claims to be then it's not going to be subject to this typical you know kind of unbelief approach but i mean you can you can definitely trace uh luther's questioning i think of the canon and the rise of protestant textual criticism from there straight to julius Wellhausen and all of the documentary hypothesis which ultimately leads to the complete dissolution in the academic world of the old mm -hmm. testament then we get the Jesus quest doing the exact same thing with the New Testament. So I'm not saying Luther himself didn't believe the text. Right. Um, but he allows for the possibility. He's the, he sets the precedent for the academic world being the new authoritative expositor. Whereas prior to that, it was the ecclesial world. And clearly Jesus didn't set up an academic debate squad. He set up a church.
Right on. Thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. Uh, Dr. Branson, anything that you would like to add? Give, give me the question again that you were. Yeah, basically um, the role of higher criticism and how it affects oh. uh, the church in Luther's time and then the logical conclusions of his ideas today. I, I wouldn't have much to say about that. Except okay. I hate Hegel. That's all. <laughs> That's it. We'll get a t-shirt made. Of that. <laughs> yeah. so, Hegel with a little line. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, Dale or David, uh, and, and Dane, since you've got to leave uh, here in a minute, is there anything that you want to add to, to what you just said? No, I, I um, Good. just don't like higher criticism. Yeah. <laughs> Moses wrote the Torah. Um, Paul wrote all the epistles attributed to him. I mean, the the fact that that's even um, been circulated in in Christian circles is is kind of shameful, in all honesty. Mm. So how's that? Just, just look up Julius Wellhausen. He he's he was very open about what he wanted to get rid of. You know, yeah. he, he had this assumption that true religion can't have ritual and ceremony, so all that stuff had to be purged, and then then we would get to the true sort of core. Uh, scaled down religion. Mm -hmm. David, I'm on Dale. the flip side. I can't imagine any religion without ritual and ceremony. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, guys, uh, this has been enjoyable. Um, appreciate uh, Dr. Branson and Jay y'all's time. Um, the other three, I, I see y'all all the time. So um, I'll see you soon again. Um, but uh, this has been great. I got to hop off and go help get some kids to sleep. So. Right. Well, nice I appreciate meeting, you man. joining us, Dane. God bless all y'all. God bless. Brother. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, David, Dell, anything, any questions, closing. comments, concerns? You guys both good? Oh, so this isn't the closing. Thank no, I, I mean, yeah, I, we got I got super chat. Yeah, yeah, I've got my last question out. Uh, Jay just answered it. So if you've got any follow up or if you want to ask a question or whatever. No, just, uh, just I don't have any further questions at this time, but uh, okay. just for the closing, I just wanted to kind of reiterate uh, uninterrupted what my argument was again, just for the audience to get it out uh, properly type thing. So I'll do that at the closing, though. OK. All right. Uh, let's jump then to uh, the audience questions. And again, uh, before I jump into these, I just want to say again, thank you for Jay and Bo uh, for coming on. Uh, this has been super enlightening for me, and I know I'm going to be on this video for a little bit now. So if you like the content, if you liked what Jay said, what Bo said, and the little pushback that we got from uh, Dell and Jay, that was fun. So I appreciate that, guys. Cordial and 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 heated, and so I like it. But uh, but like like this video. Uh, think about subscribing to the channel as well. If you can't financially support us, obviously subscribers help us in multiple, multiple ways. And if y'all would, please pray for us. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to support anyone is, is by offering prayers up to God uh, for that person. And so that would be a really great way to help us out as well. But the first super chat we have here is from Orthodoxology. I'll post it on the screen and read it out. Have you guys ever encountered the first principles of scripture argument made by Clement of Alexandria that Anthony Rogers and the likes make? And what are your thoughts on that? I'm not familiar with this argument, no. Oh, I'm not either, to be honest, uh, Dr. Branson. Yeah, no, me neither. I was going to ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So orthodoxology, if there's another way you want to uh, phrase it or kind of elaborate on it a little bit, uh, send me a, a comment and I'll post that up as well. Uh, let's see here. Our other super chat is from Jamie. Church can't change the law. Second Thessalonians two thoughts. uh I, that's the in that the section about the apostasy and uh you know the man of sin correct um, yeah i guess the argument is that anyone that would attempt to quote change law is therefore uh the man of sin or so i, I don't see what, how that relates to second Thessalonians too but um yeah i think if you watch the documentary that my friend lewis made over at orthodox shahada it's called orthodox worship continuity uh, with the Old Testament temple and synagogue, you'll you'll see that the church isn't really, quote, changing the law. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jesus gave the law, 
which we would say the New Testament makes it clear that he was there at Mount Sinai. He says this to the Pharisees, mm -hmm. you know, in John 5 and John 8 and 9, that he was there with Moses, he was there with Abraham. So Jesus is the one that gave the law at Mount Sinai. And if certain ceremonial or dietary things referred in their practice and their celebration by the Jews to him, and he fulfilled those things, then they can still be kept in a unique spiritual way. So, for example, for us, you know, if you look at Paul's epistles and to the Corinthians, he says that not to put to to uh, seeds in a field. He says that's a spiritual principle that we still keep by not being united with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So even the ceremonial commands are not necessarily, quote, done away. Uh, they might be fulfilled in a certain way that they were kept by Israel, but then spiritually still kept by us as the church. And then some of those ceremonial commands are also still kept by the church. We still have holy places. We still have holy water. We still have an altar. We still have uh, incense and a temple. And a lot of those things that were in the Old Testament, we still have. Um, but I would also add, too, that for the Jews, it was never the Jewish idea that all of the laws were supposed to be kept by the Gentiles anyway. I mean, it's physically yeah. not possible. So, Yeah, I was going to say that. that. It's something I've noticed... Um, I think it's one thing that attracted me to orthodoxy too, was I, I felt like I didn't really find a lot of churches that I thought had a coherent relationship with the Torah. Um, and of course, yeah, it, in Judaism, um, you know, Jews don't expect Gentiles to keep the Sabbath or keep kosher or, or you know, any, any of these things there's, uh, in Judaism, there's there's the idea of the Noahide commandments, which for them there's seven, um, uh, which are so. If you if you think about the the idea is sort of sort of like concentric circles, right? So you've got you know Adam and Eve. Um, anything that God commands them uh, has to be followed by all of their descendants. Anything that you know God commands Noah has to be followed by all of his descendants and. And so on. So you get these sort of, you know, smaller circles as you get down to Abraham and then Moses and the children of Israel and then the Davidic covenant, you know, and then you get down to Christ. And you, you yeah. could tell that that what happens in the in the book of Acts is kind of this question of like, is the so is this new covenant with Jesus like a yet smaller, you know, concentric circle? So it's all taking place within the Torah. And so Gentiles need to, you know, become Jewish to be able to get into that covenant. Mm -hmm. Or is he taking us all the way back up out to, you know, Adam and Noah and, and it's, it's, you know, expanded to everyone. And the, the ruling that, that James uh, gives at the, this council of Jerusalem in the book of Acts uh, where he says, look, let's just tell the, the Gentile converts um, uh, to abstain from blood and things that have been strangled, sexual immorality, uh, and not to eat food sacrificed to idols. Those are four of the Noahide commandments in later rabbinic Judaism. Um, they left out a few that uh, it's not clear if that's kind of an early stage of the development of that idea and maybe the rabbis sure. came up with some extra stuff later or the ones that he's leaving out are kind of self-explanatory too for christians so but anyway i mean you know the the um the the torah is you know even on the jewish view i mean it's it's only specifically given to israel and it is not expected um for gentiles to follow all of it. in fact interestingly you know in judaism um you know, there's the, even the idea that that some of the commandments in the Torah um, really should not be kept by Gentiles. I noticed something in the chat a while back about keeping the Sabbath. And the, I always, I always kind of, I, I mean, I used to kind of think about that sort of issue too. But, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the Talmud, I mean, it, it really is like a, a Gentile who observes the Sabbath is worthy of the death penalty. Um, I mean, it's a really like it's this hugely insulting thing in the in the Torah because there's this commandment to to Adam, you know, you'll work now, like after the fall, you have to work now and bring bread out of the earth by the sweat of your brow. And it's a specific, you know, a specific gift to Israel to have the Sabbath. 
mm-hmm. and it's not meant for Gentiles. And so for, you know, in, in the Talmud, it's the, and, and in Maimonides, you know, there's some very harsh words for, you know, uh, Gentiles trying to keep the Sabbath. Um, Cause it's like, that's not, that's not directed towards you. Like so it, there's not a lot of Torah or law that, that is directed to Gentiles anyway. But. I'd like to add a point too, if I can. Yeah. yeah. I just remembered. So, uh, if you read Hebrews, particularly Hebrews 7 is a really important chapter uh, in regard to this question, because Hebrews, obviously the book is about the superiority of the new covenant to the mm-hmm. old. And we might be tempted to think uh, on a surface reading, maybe that, well, Hebrews is really just saying that all the Old Testament stuff is fulfilled. You know, when I was a Protestant, I typically read it that way. Right. Although uh, I detect that this question is kind of coming from probably a Messianic Judaism or Hebrews roots kind of uh, vantage point or something like that. But if you read Hebrews 7, it's very interesting because it notes that contra the uh, sort of messianic Hebrew roots type of attitude, there is still pre- there is still a, a priesthood, but it's a new priesthood that is, is fulfilled the Aaronic priesthood. So in other words, priesthood didn't go away. Mm-hmm. The Aaronic priesthood was instituted as a lesser, uh, newer priesthood from the Melchizedekian priesthood. Right. And mm-hmm. Hebrews is making the argument of superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood and the church is the Melchizedekian priesthood. This is very important for us because it's a great, it's a crucial argument that we have to make against Muslims because Muslims want to re- retain worship from the Torah and the prophets. Yet there's no notion of sacrifice, no notion of temple, no notion of altar, no notion of priesthood. But God has always had a priesthood. And in fact, Hebrews yeah. 7 is arguing that the eternal heavenly priesthood of Melchizedek is the priesthood of Christ. Mm-hmm. So that was typological of Christ. It's superior to the Aaronic. The Aaronic was an image of that, believe it or not, is what I think Hebrews is arguing. Mm-hmm. So it's saying that wow. in verse 12, the priesthood being changed, therefore there is a change of the law. So in fact, you're correct. The church can't change the law, but the God man can change the law. Right. Right on. That. I love it. I love it, guys. Uh, so the next super chat we had is from Deanna D's. Uh, let's see. She said, "Thank you for having Jay on." Uh, I know we just got one. Let's see here. Uh, Solomon Jay's ultimate appeal is same as yours, Dell Holy Spirit. Um, so I made a you- distinction between normativity and the notion of public authority. And a separate question of the individual's subjective assurance, which comes to the Holy Spirit. So I made a distinction actually between these two different things, which are often conflated. For example, you hear, you'll hear Roman Catholics do this a lot where they say, well, the only way for you as an individual to have certainty is the Pope. But, the, but does the Pope really do that? Does he actually function to give individual certitude? And that question mm-hmm. and that sort of bait and switch that the Roman Catholic apologists are doing there, it's kind of trading on an ambiguity of, category confusion so normativity and public authority is not the same thing as personal subjective assurance those are two different things they relate to one another but they're two different things so my ultimate the fact that my ultimate appeal is the same really doesn't say much because in the the final analysis everybody's going to appeal to the holy spirit right that's what i said at the very beginning the protestant the roman catholic the orthodox are all going to say that for the individual's final ultimate appeal of assurance it's going to come down to the holy spirit so we all if we all agree on that well then why do we have all these different groups and sects and churches well that's because of the historical public uh, uh events and debates and you know the messiness of church history right that that's the public domain and the debate that we're ultimately having here is not whether the individual can have a, a, a assurance the debate that we're having is what's the public normative authority that states what the canon is, what the scriptures mean, and binding and loosing. Dr. Branson, anything that you'd like to add? No, I think that's right. I, I always <laughs> think it's weird when people, I just find infallibility such a weird thing to argue about. Because if it's, if it's, you know, if the idea is it, we're talking about like, knowing something with a hundred percent certainty or something. Right. Um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, like, let's suppose the Pope is infallible or something like, 
Mm-hmm. I always think, well, good for him. Like, I wish I was the Pope so I could know. <laughs> but, but like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to be a hundred percent sure that the Pope is infallible. So like, if he issues some, th- I mean, if he says something, I think it contradicts the Bible. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I guess that's really the right way to think about it. I'm just think like, oh, I guess I was wrong that he was infallible. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like, so it just seems yeah. like, I mean, because if, 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 I mean, even if I've got like 90, I'm 99% sure that he's infallible, like just the way probability theory works out, like if he says something I'm like 99% sure isn't right, then I'm just going to have to revise my probability distributions and thing. Well, I guess he wasn't infallible after all. So I always, always find, and then if you're just talking about infallibility, like, like it's this metaphysical thing, like he's just got this magical power so that he'll, he in fact will never be wrong. Like, great, but is it, but if I don't have any evidence for that, then it doesn't help me. So, was, so yeah, I mean, so yeah, I do think. I mean, yeah, obviously, ultimately, everyone just has to think about things for themselves, and hopefully, the Holy Spirit leads them to to the truth or whatever. Like, but that's kind of an epistemic point, and I take it the that's a, Jay's just saying that's a separate point from like who has authority. Sort of like I would say that, I mean, the Supreme Court has the authority in the United States to interpret the law, and that's who has the authority. How do I, how do I know that for sure? Well, I, you know, I read the Constitution, I I took, you know, social studies in high school or whatever. You know, they could, those, my teacher could have been lying to me, or they could have been wrong, I could misunderstand it or whatever, but. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there the is way no it's Supreme going. Court. It's all AI generated deep fakes. And the whole time <laughs> thought there yes. really was a court. There's not. Yes, that is probably true. <laughs> and you know that with 100% certainty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right on, right on. Okay, guys. So that's uh, done with the super chats. We do have, a, oh no, wait, I lied. There's one more that just came in. No. Uh, $5 per Aspera at Astra. As an evangelical atheist, I still find the untangling of church history and religious ideas fascinating. Good, to- good content, guys. Ex evangelical atheist. Ex evangelical, yeah. Oh, okay. Used Thanks. to be. I was. That's not me, by the way, putting that in there. <laughs> <laughs> you read my super chat wrong. No, <laughs> no that's uh, yeah, that that caught me off guard for a second. I was like, wait a minute, because I have heard of like, you know, Christian atheists, which I don't know. Uh, I want to interview uh, one of the girls that I saw on TikTok uh, advocating for that position. We were supposed to set something up, but it never came to fruition, but that's okay. Um, so, okay. So there was a couple questions that came in that was not super chats. Um, and they're kind of, I don't know, almost I get the sense of like imperative that they want me to ask you, Jay. Um, so this first one is, and I don't know what this acronym stands for. Uh, maybe you do. Can you guys please ask Jay about chalk? Yeah, that, that, I think they're just being funny. That's uh, okay. I, I have a sponsor, so my sponsor is chalk.com. <laughs> so if you're looking for ways to boost testosterone, use the promo code J fifty J A Y five zero at chalk.com. <laughs> right on, right on. Okay, um, let's see here. Orthodoxology. Maybe Jay and Bo can bring up some common objections. That, I don't know. I can, David, did you put that one on there? No, Dale? Common objections to what? I, good That's question. A, to, to, that. to to the critique of social media? Oh, group? I think maybe some, yeah, uh, common, common objections. objections here against the orthodoxy, I think, is what he's asking for. No? Or, or against uh, uh, yeah. the orthodoxy. I was thinking more on the Sola Scriptura line. But... And with that, that's a wrap. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I so think we some of the more? things we've heard tonight are common. We we hear the obje- right. you know, the common objections are, uh, you know, the scriptures are theonustos, God breathed. They're sufficient to make the man of God able to do, you know. So, but a lot of those things aren't are, are absolutized uh, or assumed to be just about the written text, right? For example, the scriptures are able to make the man of God able for every good work and so forth. Well, but does that mean that that's all that is needed because the scriptures are able to do that? Right. I mean, the church is also able to help the, you know, don't forsake the assembling, right. Pray Mm -hmm. with one another. Those texts, a lot of times don't mention other things that are integral to what we do, like prayer or going to church. So we wouldn't absolutize those things as if nothing else was needed or necessary. 
uh, because it's highlighting one thing that is, is perhaps even primary. Don, I think you could even argue it. that some of the scripture, some of the church fathers, and this is a, a common Protestant objection. Uh, well, the, the church fathers speak of this primacy of scripture. Well, but it, that still doesn't negate that there's other authorities and that there's other uh, uh, divine mm -hmm. revelation that's not strictly written down, right? So the fact that one is, is you, for example, in the ecumenical councils, you often see them kind of citing scripture. Uh, they'll use patristic citations prior to, like if it's the fifth council, what did the previous church fathers say? Then they'll use arguments of logic and reason. Um, and so there's kind of, there is, you could say maybe a tier, but primacy or giving a certain, even within the scriptures, for example, we think that the gospels kind of have a, a primacy uh, mm -hmm. in the liturgy. They're honored above Paul's epistles, but honoring something above or giving a kind of a, a, a hierarchy to even the text that doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, well, then the ones that aren't, you know, the Gospels are therefore fallible and they're wrong or, you know, having hierarchy doesn't necessitate a dialectical either or of therefore not infallible or something like that. So um, I hear a lot of Protestant objections, I think, typically based on just sort of assumptions about when one church father says that, you know, he has a high view of Scripture, but then they'll ignore the other places where he talks about the necessity of tradition, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, I saw that on uh, your and Pedro's uh, debate. That seemed like an objection that he was bringing up a lot, uh, especially with, I think it was Athanasius. Is that, does that sound familiar? Yeah, I mean, Athanasius, yeah. you know, basically says the Holy Spirit guided Nicaea. So I don't right. think any Protestant would agree with that. Right, right <laughs> on. Uh, Dr. Branson? Yeah, I'm... You good? good? Okay. All right. Uh, the last question we have actually comes from our other co-host, Joshua Davidson. And I thought this was, uh, this was pretty good. Uh, my question is, can Jay get us in contact with Peugeot? I need some symbolism, <laughs> but all right. Uh, you mean for, to come on your show? Is that what you're saying? I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. I can always, I can always ask. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. Um, I don't know if Josh wants to add anything else to that or not. He's, uh, I don't know why he's not here. He said uh, something about being tired or whatever, or else he would have been here, but he apologized for not uh, being able to show up. But Jay, since you gave your sponsor, um, if I can find mine real quick, I'm going to give mine. It's BarnabasClothing.com. Uh, you can, uh, they've got Christian uh, t-shirts. They've got hoodies. They've got jewelry. They've got stickers. They've got all kinds of stuff. I'm actually wearing one of their shirts now. Um, and, and I love, I love Barnabas clothing. Um, I've been a brand ambassador for them for about two, three months now, and everything about them is just phenomenal. So I'm not trying to like hype them up to make them out to be something that they're not. I really, really like their, uh, their stuff that they, and the, and their brand. Uh, if you want to enter a discount code BCAMB Tyler F 15, you'll get 15% uh, percent off your order at checkout so check check them out um uh, like i said they've got a lot of different things on there and i really really like their uh their quality of their material so let me know what you think about barnabas clothing david dell any i mean we're wrapping up is there anything that you guys want to add um now's your last chance to do it if you do thank you mark for the comment i didn't see that one thank you mark um and orthodoxology had that one last one thank you for this comment as well um, nice uh but yeah guys uh two weeks of worth coming in july i'll be hosting those shows with travis ben Watkins. uh will be on the eighth and travis with uh rich subtles the faithiest faithiest atheist will both be on those first two weeks of july and i'm excited to uh see what they have to talk about one's on the value of disagreement and the other's on value and uh theism so i'm really excited to have those deep philosophical discussions with these guys and and see where they're where they're at so especially with travis you know he's growing in his his walk and doing stuff like that so i want to see be, where he's at now i'll be interested to see what travis brings to the table too on that one yeah. since he's converted to orthodoxy as well and yeah. see if well, you're not allowed works. to be on so i'm not going to be on. <laughs> I'm, home <laughs> <up to laughs> July. I'm taking a break from from all of I this know, so. yeah. Yeah, My wife's yeah, pregnant, yeah. and I need to spend some time with her before this baby comes. So, yeah. so if y'all could be playing, uh, praying about that, that'd be that'd be great too. But yeah, she's what uh, 
I want to say 11 weeks this week. So she's, you know, it's still early, but she's definitely feeling that first trimester pain. So uh, be praying for her if you would. Yeah. Uh, but Dale, is there anything coming up on Real Seekers that we need to know about? Um, well, the only thing I had, I was just going to do like that recap of. Yeah, like, yeah, please. Of the, my talk with Jay and stuff. So, of course. All right. So, so yeah. So, so what I'm understanding here. So it is interesting because when I approach this question of the canonicity, um, I don't really necessarily care about what Jay said. He cared about this normative kind of like an outsider test. How, how do you tell as an outsider? I'm more interested in how do we gain knowledge personally as to what is scripture or not. And the, uh, you know, that's why I can appeal to properly basic beliefs. And I think that's a valid form of gaining a warranted true belief. Um, however, I think that God can provide us with multiple sources of warrant, uh, some of which may qualify as that outsider test. And that's where I think my uh, mere Protestantism or, or, you know, the Protestant Bible onlyism is warranted based on the fact of, of an argument, right? So a modus, simple modus ponens argument. If the majority of, of true Christians uh, over t uh, across denominations or sects over time accept uh, a doctrine as a true essential doctrine. Um, I think Jay's right where he's saying I might be implied that understanding what the canon is in order to use the canon to define the essential beliefs is needed. So, okay, great. So let's include canonicity as an essential belief for the sake of argument. Um, we, uh, if they agree on that, then it is probably true. Um, obviously it's a fact, you know, we can affirm the antecedent that, yeah, the majority of Christians over time across denominations do accept the Protestant canon as script, as inspired, um, even if they accept other ones. So it's important to note this, this argument is warranted. It is valid. It is sound. Um, now Jay does, he challenges that first premise, right? So why is it the case that the majority of um, uh, Christians across denominations over time accepting something, how does that make it true? And that's where I would just appeal to the fact that, look, the Holy Spirit is said to guide all true Christians, at the very least, into essential truths, gospel truths. But isn't that based on what's in the text, the claim about the Holy Spirit guiding us? Right, That's from John, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, right. But the question is, what are the texts? So it's a circular argument still. But it's 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 not because if you if you are getting knowledge from the Holy Spirit as to a certain proposition, right? Like the Holy Spirit in the moment produces within me a properly basic belief with respect to a given proposition or something like that, right? Um, well, I'm, I'm familiar with planning as theories, but I mean, I could just simply ask you, how do you know that that's a properly basic belief? The, the, so now canonicity of scripture, which is a historical event, is now something that's a properly basic self-evident principle. How do you divorce the historical formation of the canon from, uh, I mean, you, it's not it's not a priori. It's not a self-evident principle. Well, it, it can be. Any proposition can well, be. You can say that, but how is that given uh, the fact that your basis was the text of John? You just cited the text of John for how you are reading the Holy Spirit in this event, right? right? Okay, so okay, so if if you don't mind, just let me like say my thing, and then I'll let you respond with your counter response after. You'll get the last word, I promise. But um, I just want to give how it works. Like I said, so here in the moment, God provides us through the Holy Spirit that means of obtaining warrant. How does warrant work? Well, it produces a properly basic belief. This is prop a warranted true belief. So that's propositional knowledge. How do I know that I'm warranted? Well, this is where we get into the externalism and internalism debate. I believe that we are acquainted with knowledge. So we have knowledge of acquaintance whenever we are warranted. So that's the mechanism of how I know that the Holy Spirit is actually giving me this properly basic belief and that it, it counts as knowledge. Um, okay, so great. So in the here and now, that's, that's how I would, I guess, um, appeal to this. I know that it's true that the Holy Spirit has to provide us with most Christians across denominations over time with the true essential beliefs, at least. 
Um, that's all I'm arguing for. It's a minimal argument. I know that that is true. And using that, that's how I can make my argument type thing. Um, no, it, it's true that, look, this, this avenue, Jay is correct, that this avenue, our source of warrant, doesn't necessarily work in the first century or the first 300 years necessarily. They didn't have that. They didn't have a completed canon at that point, right? So they can't go, well, look at the majority of Christians over time across denominations and gain warrant in that way. Um, it just may be fine that that avenue isn't open to them. They had some other source of warrant, something like James White's argument about, you know, again, the Holy Spirit is, is attesting to them. Well, look, I, I'm a Corinthian and Paul's teaching to me the letter of 1 Corinthians or something like that. And I just know the Holy Spirit attests me in a properly basic way. This is the word of God. So I know at least that that is um, that is canon kind of thing. And you can operate on that basis over time. So that yeah, that's my final word. Over to you, Jay. You can, if you want the last word, you can. Yeah. So I mean, I would just simply say that I mean, if I just posit my position as somehow a self-evident principle, on what basis would either of us try to figure out who's wrong if we have mutually exclusive claims, or if another person has a mutually exclusive claim as to what the true Christian is or what the canon is? There's yeah. got to be some way by which we can adjudicate who's right and who's wrong. They can't both be right, right? Right. Um, but I'm open to the fact of just saying, well, maybe in the first century, we just didn't have an outsider test to tell a third party, an atheist looking on or a pagan looking on. There was no uh, available means because all at the end of the day, all that matters is that individual Christians have knowledge that this is the word of God. And live on that basis. Maybe so, but again, I'm just trying to figure out how it's not circular, given that your original premise, I, I'm arguing, isn't actually self-evident. It's actually wrapped up in a lot of assumptions. Some of those assumptions were that the true Christians line up with you as what, what you as a Protestant believe. That's the true Christian, right? So what I'm saying is that in the original premise, there is the assumption that the true Christians and the self-evident principles that I'm laying out are the case by which we would, how do we know that that's the starting point? Okay. Again, I'm not trying to debate, but in terms of that first premise, like how you're asking me that, how do I know that the majority well, I took issue with two things. I took issue with the first premises claim and I took issue with the notion that, uh, there was, th that this was actually the case. Uh, historically, and a third point that just because the majority of people believe it doesn't, why does that tell us that we ought to believe something? Well, right, be because in this case, it's a special type of belief, right? Like the, the I'm saying that. We well, how do you know that, right? On what basis do you know that? Because my point is that it's based on your Protestant presuppositions of what the text of John say about the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. But the question is about the text themselves. So you can't appeal to the text. And the question is about what books make up the text. Of course you can, because it's it's not the te I'm not reasoning or deriving this conclusion from what I read in the text. I'm but not you did, because no. the argument was that you said that the Holy Spirit is who is my first principle guiding me to because we're told that he would lead us and guide us into all truth. That's a quote from John. That's from the text. OK, so so here here's what I'm saying for for like the early Christians. They hear the message, right? What about you? Yeah. OK. OK, fine. So I, I hear this proposition about the Holy Spirit guiding us to truth. It comes from John. I, I gain knowledge in a properly basic way. This is true. This proposition is true. So it's not an argument per se. How do you now, know I, that that first position or first proposition is self-evident and true? How do I know? Uh, through, like I said, the Holy Spirit produces. No, no. How do you know the Holy Spirit? <laughs> is the principle by which we are guided into truth because it's a text it's it's from a text of scripture right do you think that's self-evident or is it from scripture or is it both oh it's, okay i see what you're saying like how do i know that the holy spirit is operating uh as opposed to me just i know that your that that proposition comes from the text of john okay yeah. i don't believe that it was like beamed into your head by osmosis you got that belief from the text the text is something out of history yeah. Yeah. Not so, a self-evident maxim that you derive through philosophical speculation, right? 
Well, so that's true. Yeah. So, so property so based abuse are grounded. Comes from the text. You said whatever. that it doesn't property come from the text. Property based saying. abuse are grounded in an experience. So, in this case, this is what we learn in scripture, right? The, and it's not coming from scripture. But I'm just saying. You just said we learned it in scripture, but then you said it's not coming from scripture. No. Well, the first Christians heard it orally, and then the Holy Spirit I'm talking was about you to you. that. Well, this is what happens to you. you you're a your belief, not the first century Christians. You, your yeah. your epistemic certitude justification for the self-evident principle okay so so however i get that proposition into my head whatever experience do i read it with my eyeballs or do i hear it orally like the first christian well, if it comes from the text then jay let him answer let him answer let him answer yeah, first. He's not answering I don't the, the um, question okay. is does it come from the text he's saying no but then he said yes because grounding so there's a difference, right? So property basic beliefs are underived. They're right. So, so it's not if, I were, to, if I were to read not derived from the text. No, it's grounded. No. But you said it was derived from the text. Right. So, so you're I, saying that the phrase in the gospel of John, okay, so let, Holy let finish, and God right. in all truth, is not let, from the gospel let me just of John. Finish my point, please. Um, I, I get that you're trying to do the gotcha thing. Just just stop. We're we're friends. I I, I like you. I've had a great conversation with you, but just let we me have had it, but you're not gonna tell me to stop. I mean, we're having a conversation, so well if I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna allow you to say and assert things without making sense of well, the it's my show. I'm not I being you, you, right? Um I'm just trying to get out my point and then i'll let you get i was quiet word. for the entire time until you said i could talk okay okay so it's grounded in the experience of reading the by that so it is from the text the text hey yeah. let me finish right reading that pro then the holy spirit produces within me a properly basic belief with respect to the truth of that proposition i'm not going oh i read this in the text but it did come from the premise text. in an argument to go therefore it must be true yeah. that's the difference but that is what I think what you want to say is um, he's so he's reading the text. The justification isn't from the text, right? The justification exactly. is just sort of there by the Holy Spirit. But the question exactly. originally is, what are the texts? What makes up the Bible? The Bible is a bunch of books, right? So the question is, which books make up this book? And so unless you want it to be circular it's not going to be an appeal to the text and i'm just pointing out that your first principle is an appeal to the text i think you could say uh i mean hypothetically speaking uh you could just imagine you could just have a fever dream where you imagine the proposition that whatever whatever the proposition is right and the holy spirit uh magically makes you know it so how do we adjudicate between contradictory claims of the holy spirit right that was kind of my point with the luther example or the person who says well my canon that i've studied to is two gospels and that's it nothing else who's that to here to bow sorry who is that who was that question to jail okay uh, well, so like, what was the question again? Because I, again, I think how would we adjudicate between rival claims of the Holy Spirit's guidance when obviously in history, like everybody's going to claim, well, the Holy Spirit's guiding me. Marcion thought the Holy Spirit was guiding him to his canon, right? So when we have contradictory claims, how are we going to resolve this claim apart from normative public authority? I, can uh, I, yeah. Go ahead, I also, I mean, but besides just hypothetical, like Marcion or like, you know, just jude or something i mean there's much more innocent like real cases like this in history like the Peshitta, you know is used by the the entire like or has been used by the entire like assyrian church and lacked you know second peter and second and third john uh gregory nazianzen leaves the book of revelation out right of his canon he i mean, I mean he specifically lists the other 26 books and specifically says nothing else is part of the canon right so like there's you know people like whole commu whole churches and like saints and you know serious like there are serious canons you know of, of scripture that are different from the the protestant canon and those people would say that the holy spirit was leading them to believe that canon too well, luther believed that the holy spirit at the point where he was denying hebrews and revelation he thought the holy spirit mm -hmm. was leading him to that as well 
So we've got to have some kind of public means by which we can adjudicate these these varying Holy Spirit claims. Is my point, and that's really what I'm what we're trying to get through to you guys with with Orthodox position, right? Is that we do have a public authority that does function in that role. Okay. Uh Cool. And, and thank you. So thank you so much. I finally got it. Thank you so much, Jay, for, for indulging me in this. Like I said, I, uh, despite the, the interruptions, I've had fun. Like I, I've learned from you and stuff like that. So what, one last question, because my whole thing, what if, what if there just was no outsider test, uh, but yet there was the, an internal test for Christians to tell between competing claims? Why does there have to be an outsider test at all periods of history? Well, I think we see in the writings of the church fathers them pointing to those external tests in those centuries, right? If you read book three of Irenaeus, he's, he does precisely what I said. He does have these external signifiers and signs and things that you can point to, the apostolic succession, the reciting of the common creed. Uh, what's the, you know, do they have the same faith as the church in Rome and the other churches throughout the empire? I mean, there are these external criteria that are listed in, in many cases in the church fathers. So first of all, I just think that it's a, historically a fact that, it, that that is the case. And I also don't buy the sort of like William Lane Craig position that there is such a thing as lowest common denominator Christianity or that we could in some way scale off who's a Christian without some kind of public historical reference. For example, Mormons uh, are not Christian, Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christian, but that again hinges on, you know, is Nicaea an expression of what it is to be a Christian? If it is, then now we're again, it's, you see how it's not as self-evident or as clear once we get into the weeds, we actually have to start ferreting out, okay, well actually, you know, Nicaea teaches the, the much more than just the deity of Christ, says all these other things. So now, now Nicaea is not actually any real historical thing for a Protestant. It's really just a, uh, it's just a, well, it's nice that that happened, but it really doesn't have any relevance to a Protestant, you see, because the actual teaching of Nicaea includes all of these other elements that no Protestant accepts. So I'm just saying, it, you can't have a self-evident um, uh, internal positions as a Christian when Christianity is a historic religion with a history of church fathers and people putting the Bible together. There's no such thing as a Bible or canon divorced from history. That's I just don't see how this is possible. And I understand the motivations for why we, why, we might want to construct a sort of a priori guidance of the Holy Spirit. But really, my point was just that it looks to me like what that amounts to when you flesh it out is just Protestantism, right? Cool. But Thank that's you. the thing in question is Protestantism. So Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for, for answering that. And yeah, uh, thanks for the conversation. Absolutely. All right, y'all. That was interesting. So, and Jay and Bo, again, I really, really appreciate y'all coming on to do this. We'd love to have you guys back on again. Um, sure. And Anytime. maybe talk about like Christology or something. By the way, Jay, I was going to ask uh, at the end of your and Pedro's conversation, uh, there was talks about doing a Christology episode with them. Did that ever come to fruition or? Not yet. I haven't heard any, haven't heard a peep. I don't know okay. what happened with Pedro. Okay. I, so, I mean, I think I, I haven't seen him on any more live streams or debates. So, I mean, there wasn't any drama. I just I haven't heard from no, him. No, right. Right, right. Okay. Right on. If that ever comes about, let me know, man, because I would love to hear you guys talk about that or, you know, uh, come on our show and, and talk about some Christology. Uh, but, y'all, that wraps it up for this episode. We will see you next time. We've got uh, one more episode this month. Uh, uh, June 30th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be talking the paranormal with one of my Roman Catholic friends, uh, Nicholas Soliner. So stay tuned for that, and we will see you next time. Until then, good night, God bless, and stay like Christ. Thank you, guys.